Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board regular meeting with executive session for January 13th, 2022. Let the record reflect that the meeting has begun at 5.02 p.m. and we are in session. So we'll start off with our first matter of business, which is the call to order and roll call. This evening, we have Governing Board Member Ms. Anna Lena Bethia present in the boardroom. We do have Governing Board Member Pedro Lopez also present in the boardroom and myself, Marissa Hernandez, Board President currently um, present in the boardroom. And just really quick before we get moving, um, for the speakers for the evening, if you could please, when you come up to the microphone, remove your mask so that the callers and our viewers on YouTube can understand um, the information that you're sharing. That is greatly appreciated. And then for the rest of the duration of the meeting, obviously we'll wear our masks unless eating. <clears throat> so this evening, the Pledge of Allegiance is going to be a replay due to the technical difficulties at the December 9th board meeting. And so this evening leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance is Rebecca Estrada, who is our treasurer from the Starlight Park Preparatory and Community School, uh, Valerie Aguirre, LFIN Kinder Liaison, Itza Aguirre, the secretary, Jeremiah Duran, Ariel Guzman, Jeremy Benitez, second grade liaison, David Lopez, administrative liaison, Genesis Vega, Valeria Canchola, vice president, Jimena Mendoza, president, Brittany Angulo, MAPS liaison, at Ziri Luna, fourth grade liaison, Gina Sotelo, first grade liaison, Dolores Garcia, fifth grade liaison, Jessalyn Perez, sixth grade liaison, Inek Luna, Ms. Rosales, advisor, Ms. Hoon, advisor, and just really quick, hello, play the video. hello, hi, Ms. Garcia. Hi, hi. So we do have me? governing board me? member Denise Garcia telephonically, and Ms. Uh, Governing Board Member Lydia Hernandez has joined the boardroom as well at approximately 5.03 p.m. Cue the video, Mike. Hi, please rise and join us. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Second. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Governing Board Member Pedro Lopez. Any discussion? All right, so we'll go ahead and do our roll call vote. Our roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Mr. Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abetia? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Abetia. Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. And I vote aye as well, and the motion carries. Well, the motion carries. We have unanimously passed our agenda for the evening's meeting. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to our next item of business, which is the reorganization of the board. Election of Governing Board present for 2022. And follow us. In following policy BDA board organizational meeting, such meeting shall be held between January 1st and January 15th, next following the election. Moving forward, reorganization will take place in the election years. In this transition year, we will proceed with nominations. So I know that we do the reorganization process every year, but according to our board policy, we only really need to do the reorganization and election of the board members following an election year where a new board member sits on the board. However, this evening we are going to proceed with the standard process. Um, so that was just a clarification. So do we have any nominations for the 2022 governing board president? Yes, Madam, Madam president. president. Go ahead, Ms. Garcia. Hi, uh, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members. All those in attendance, I'd like to nominate uh, Mr. Uh, board Member Pedro Lopez for Vice President. 
We're on the president election right now. Oh, we are? Oh, okay. Thank you. You jumped the line, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies. I am running late. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lopez. Yes, uh, Madam President, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members, uh, executive team, those in the audience. Um, I would like to nominate uh, you, Madam President Marisa Hernandez, for board president. Well, thank you, Mr. Lopez. I humbly accept the nomination. Do we have any other nominations? Okay. So then I'd like to make a motion for the approval of the nomination to president of the Cartwright Elementary School District Board for myself, Marissa Hernandez. Do we have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. So we have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by governing board member, Mr. Lopez. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll do our roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Uh, I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Mr. Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abetia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Abetia. And Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote A as well, and the motion passes unanimously. Yay. Um, thank you. I'm super excited about it. Okay. <clears throat> so our next reorganization is for the position of vice president. Do we have any nominations for the governing board vice president for the 2022 calendar year? Madam President? Madam President? Yes, Ms. Garcia. Oh, okay. I'm trying to catch up. Bear with me. Madam President and Dr. Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, all those in attendance, once again, I would like to nominate Mr. Pedro Lopez for Vice President. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. And Mr. Lopez, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for the Vice President? Awesome. So I'd like to make a motion for approval of the nomination of Governing Board Member Pedro Lopez into the position of Governing Board Vice President for 2022. Any discussion? All right, so we'll do our roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry, do we have a second? Look, I got all ahead myself. Second. second. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and then a second by Governing Board Member Ms. Denise Garcia, and now we can do a roll call vote. <clears throat> Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Mr. Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abetia? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Abetia. Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. I vote aye. Thank you. I vote aye as well, and we all voted unanimously. Congratulations, Mr. Lopez. I'm definitely excited to work alongside you in a different capacity. Um, so I'm looking forward to 2022. So that means you now get to sit over there. Do you want to remain in your position for the evening? Okay. So they'll just, we'll give a moment for um, Christine to update the name placards. Come on, Ms. Garcia, it's been wonderful. Thank you. It is had it has been quite an honor to serve Cartwright in that capacity. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, board president, uh, members of the governing board, audience, special guest, and those viewing in the audience, I would like to say thank you to uh, Vice President Garcia for um, all her service as vice president. I'm glad she's continuing on the board. And I would like to um, say congratulations to Mr. Pedro Lopez um, for to be our new vice president. And I'd like to say congratulations to uh, Ms. Marisa Hernandez for um, continuing on the presidency. We appreciate your leadership, so thank you. All right. So now for the introduction of our very important guest this evening. So we have our parent representative, Ms. Laura Martinez. Ms. Laura Martinez has two children. Her daughter previously attended Sunset and Estrella Middle School. 
Currently, she's a 12th grader. Her son is an 8th grader attending Raul H. Castro Academy of Fine Arts. Ms. Martinez enjoys being involved in the schools that her children attend. Laura Martinez is the Parent Advisory Council President. She does a great job at that. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Ms. Martinez also participates in a group for children with special needs. And as a parent, she appreciates how our superintendent, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, has handled the pandemic and the return of this 2021-2022 school year, protecting our scholars and their families. Thank you for giving us your time this evening, Ms. Martinez. It's a pleasure to have you. We also have Ms. Michella Stevens, our Cartwright Education Association representative. You're still the president, right? I'll have, yes. So Michella Stevens, I see this looks like it got a little shorter. Michella Stevens is an avid elective teacher at Atkinson Middle School. She started teaching in Las Vegas and made her way to the Cartwright School District in 2017. She enjoys promoting college and career readiness to her students. Thank you, Ms. Michella Stevens, for being here. Happy New Year. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have our principal representative, Delon Leggett. Thank you for being here this evening. Mr. Delon Leggett is the proud principal at Harris Elementary School. He is currently serving in his 22nd year in education. He is a graduate of Tolleson High School, Lincoln University in Missouri, and Northern Arizona University. His parents served in the United States Air Force for 20 years, giving him a chance to travel around the United States and overseas before settling in Arizona. During his time as an educator, he has taught social studies classes and history classes in high school and in the local Maricopa colleges. He has also served as an assistant principal, school site representative for the Certified Teacher Association, and has coached various sports. In his off time, he enjoys spending time with his two kids, Erilyn and Ajani, as well as watching college football and USA, USA 7's rugby competitions. That is quite a sport. <laughs> Thank you for giving us your time this evening. It is a pleasure to have you here. And also just to make an announcement to our representatives, if you would like to comment, please just um, let me know so that I can call you up to the stand. Thank you. So moving on to item seven, that will be presented by Ms. Veronica Sanchez and it is our Cartwright School District number 83 Award of Excellence. Good evening, Madam President. Good evening, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, governing board members, executive team, and those who are watching us through YouTube. It is my pleasure to uh, replay a video that was supposed to be played during December, which was our Award of Excellence winners then. And just as a reminder, before we play the video, the uh, Glen L. Downs Youth and Government Club actually won this award back in December. And as participants of that government club, these scholars represented their school well during the gymnasium groundbreaking ceremony. And they spoke eloquently and passionately about uh, what the school had to offer in front of district leadership and dignitaries at the site. And their teacher, Mr. Alvarez, was also uh, an award winner. And he is just so dedicated to these children. And now you can watch the video. So I think it's a recognition for what they've been doing. So we've, they've really taken a leadership role here on the, uh, at the school. But in addition to that, there, there was a groundbreaking ceremony and they stepped up and they, they um, talked about why it was so important for them, how they would benefit from it, how it affects the community, both the school and then the wider community. And, um, you know, that they, that they, 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 were, they had a speech writing committee that they got together, they wrote that, and they, they said, these are the things that are important to us, this is why this is important to us. And it's a lot different, right, than if it's, than for us, like, why is it important for us? And um, I think uh, the people that were there were um, impressed by what they were doing, and then just what they continue to do. So we are the youth and government delegation um, in Maryville. We're actually the first time, the first people represent, representing um, Maryville um, for, in forever. So it's a, it's a, it's really honest. Um, honestly, it's, it's it's a really good gift. So 
Um, what we do is we make bills and we present them. We, we always work towards this, this time of year um, to present our bills in the um, Arizona's capital. And what we do is we, we practice law, we, we make bills, we learn how to write them, and we learn how to speak in front of people, and we, we help each other, you know, get more comfortable, and we also just teach each other, you know, life skills, um, how to, you know, uh, be nicer to one another, and we just, we're really just, you know, making those bills and just working together as a group. I think that the kids, the ideas, I think there's a lot of um, them coming up with their ideas, them finding, um, them finding um, solutions, identifying problems, finding solutions that they have some ownership, that they have um, uh, some agency in this and that they see that they can, they can make a change. And then for, for other students to see what they're doing, I think it's, it's going to kind of rub off and then see like, oh, you did this, I can do this too. We're all so different and we all have ideas and we all can share them and we all can express them, right? And we're able to express them and we're able to talk about them like freely and like, and we're not like being like stopped or we're not being told, no, that's wrong. It's amazing, like you get to tell people things you've been thinking about, things you've been keeping to yourself about. I joined this group because I wanted to like speak out because I was like very shy in the beginning. And I got a lot of help with like my mentor or my friend, uh, Marleni, our president. And I also got help by Mr. A and like the friends and like I made so many new friends and they're all like so like good. Yeah, in the beginning I was so scared to like talk or like ask people questions or like talk about stuff. And now I'm just like, I can ask anybody anything and they'll give me like the best answer, like supporting answer. I would say that this is a good reflection of our school and, and the direction that our school is going. Um, I think that uh, these these students would are really um, putting themselves out there and saying, "This is this is Glenelg Downs. We're representing the school, we're representing the community, we're, we're representing the district." And I think it's a very good representation of who we are. So I want to thank uh, Mr. A as well as all of the scholars and uh, Vivian Nash for allowing us to film that video and congratulations to them. I also want to let you know that Chase has, uh, is sponsoring uh, the Award of Excellence uh, every month and they are also sending gifts to, to our scholars and our teacher um, for their great work. So congratulations to them. I want to thank everyone who attended tonight's reception. I hope you guys are full. They have great sandwiches and fruit and um, we want to thank Food Services for that. And the reason why we had the reception tonight was because we're honoring all of you, our entire governing board members, for receiving the Boardsmanship Award uh, from ASBA. And that was announced during ASBA and the ASA conference back in December. Uh, the award was given to several boards across Arizona for commitment to board development and education. And here are the the duties for, for this amazing award. So I wanted to read them off to you. Board members are to sit in trust for their diverse communities and in that capacity are charged with meeting the community's expectations and aspirations for the public education of their students. They are entrusted with the guardianship and wise expenditure of scarce tax dollars and they are responsible for maintaining and preserving the buildings, grounds and other areas of the school district that the community has put in their trust. Uh, they are responsible for providing leadership that ensures a clear shared vision, vision of education for their schools that sets high standards for the education of all students and requires the effective and efficient operation of their districts. They adopt policies that give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer board policy and are also responsible for the regular monitoring of the district's performance and compliance, compliance with policies. And we want to thank you, as it wants to thank you for the, your countless hours of volunteer service to the public, to education, to your scholars, and to this entire community. So board members, congratulations. This is the official plaque that you all will be receiving. Also, you will be receiving, receiving individual awards with your names on them. So if you could please come down here so we could take a beautiful picture of you with your individual awards. Come on down. You're also receiving a gift from ASBA. 
And lastly, we want to mention that this month is Board Recognition Month. So this award comes at the exact perfect moment. Again, we want to thank you for all the incredible work that you all do. Can they get an applause, please? And Ms. Garcia, we will make sure that you get your award. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Super proud of the young adult government at Glenelg Downs. <clears throat> one. All right, so we are going to now move on to, well, first before we move on, I'm very proud of our board. Thank you to all of you for being excellent uh, stewards of our public school dollars and supporting all of our students and staff. We definitely can't do it as one person, so I'm grateful to have an amazing board. <clears throat> Moving on to item D, that is our call to the public. This evening, we do have a few. <clears throat> Let me just get my water prepped. And maybe move the, well, for the call to public, I'm just going to move this over. All right. For this meeting, call to the public. The governing board will not take any legal action on matters raised during this portion of the call to the public unless it pertains to items included on the agenda. A three minute time limit is set and all are asked to adhere to this limit. Time allotments are for each individual comment and may not be transferred. The governing board may direct staff to study matters raised by the public or reschedule those matters for a future consideration, discussion and possible action at a later date. Written public comments are due by 4 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, January 13th, 2022, which is today. And individual public comments received telephonically will be placed in the Zoom waiting room until it is time to share their comment. Do we have any callers? Okay, so we can let the caller go first and then I'll read the emailed submissions. <coughs> Hi, caller, are you there? Are you there? I am. I am. Hi. Would you please first state your name and then you are hello, free hello. to make... Hello, hello. You are free to make... There's a little bit I'm of a sorry, delay. I'm sorry, you're now. cutting out. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Can you hear can me? Can you hear me? Yes, but if you have a device that's on YouTube, could you mute it? Uh, I don't, uh, have, I don't any have any other device, device on. on. Okay. We're having a little bit of a delay over here and a little bit of an echo. But if you could please state your name for the record. <clears throat> and there is a 30-second delay All right. between All right, this is Deborah Stone. Thank you, Deborah, for being here this evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, again, I'm Deborah Stone. I'm a previous board member for uh, the Cartwright School District. And uh, I currently have uh, three students uh, enrolled at the Harris uh, Elementary School. My nieces and nephews uh, were uh, proud participants and supporters of uh, both Harris School and the Cartwright District and were uh, very happy uh, to be part of it. I, I want to congratulate you this evening for your boardsmanship. I understand the work that goes into uh, being a, uh, a volunteer board member and I congratulate you for the award that you've received. That's not easy to attend all the classes and do all the work that's necessary. And you've done it and you deserve it. And I thank you for that uh, in the name of many people in the community. 
I also would like to uh, take a moment and thank you for uh, the g gymnasiums that are going in place. We saw the presentation from Down School, and there's also uh, one going in at Harris School. I was fortunate enough to be there with my family for the groundbreaking ceremony at Harris School, and we're really looking forward to having that uh, available next year for our students. Uh, it's a great investment of tax dollars, and it's going to be a benefit to every child uh, in each of these schools, and hopefully all the schools will eventually uh, get a gymnasium. Uh, it's there because it's something we put money into as a community. We support uh, the district, and we believe uh, the importance of investing in our students, and a gymnasium is important for that. It's going to be there so we can have PE classes during those hot months when we come back uh, to school in August and also late in spring, and even this year we had inclement weather during the winter that kept kids from being able to go outside. So, I'm, again, I thank you for putting that in place. We know that PE provides uh, the kind of activity that kids need for a positive impact in their learning. It gets their bodies ready, their minds ready. It gets rid of stress. It teaches them judgment and leadership skills, cooperation, so many things that prepares them to be good citizens and good students. And we know that our kids look forward to that important activity each week. So ensuring that we have a place to do that in these two schools and other schools in the future is certainly to be applauded. Uh, but with this in mind, I wanted to bring up uh, the subject that uh, my understanding is that there are recommendations for yet next year's budget deficits uh, to be handled in part by cutting some of the PE classes for our students. Uh, right now, our students receive just two PE classes a week, and that's that's a, a bare minimum, uh, in my opinion, and uh, I certainly uh, would encourage the board to really relook really at that uh, as an issue. Our our community, uh, we know the income level of the parents and families can't go out and pay for extracurricular sports such as soccer and Pop Warner and Little League after school, so we depend on that time in, in the class. Um, class week to go to at least two times where kids get to exercise their bodies and build the skills uh, that I talked about. And certainly doing this now and considering doing this now when we're investing millions of dollars in new buildings that are built specifically for physical education, it really flies in the face of what the taxpayers are here to support. So I'm encouraging the board to really relook at that decision. And certainly if I was sitting with among you today, I would be bringing this uh, topic up uh, during your discussions about it and saying where else can we look uh, to make uh, cutbacks and tighten our belts, uh, but taking away programs that every student uh, needs and deserves, uh, I think would be a huge mistake. So again, I thank you for your, uh, your boardsmanship and all the work that you do, and I ask you sincerely to reconsider uh, any thoughts on uh, cutting our PE programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stone. It's always a pleasure to have a previous sitting board member um, call in for the evening. So we appreciate you taking that time also and for continuing to be so invested in the community. Thank you for being here this evening. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we, seeing that we have no other callers, the remaining call to the publics are all emails, and so I will read each of the individual emails. The first one is from Alexandra Wisniewski, to whom it may concern. I am writing to you to express my concern about cutting a PE class from our students and a prep time from our teachers. Our students need to develop an active lifestyle, and sometimes we as their teachers are their only outlet to that healthy lifestyle. Our students, our students need two days of PE for a total of 80 minutes. My students are very inactive and many times go home and play video games all night. School is their only chance to become active and find a love for sports and outside hobbies in a world full of technology. I would like to know how this is encouraging families to enroll their students here and how this is encouraging teachers to sign a contract with Cartwright. Thank you, Alexandra Wisniewski.
This next one is from Maureen Cullis. The subject is keep PE two times a week. I have been an educator in this district for 30 plus years, and I would like to express my concern for the health and welfare of our scholars. The effects of this pandemic on public health are obvious. Our scholars are struggling with their weight, their fitness, their social emotional health. Our scholars need more opportunities to move, play, learn, and grow. Please keep PE to twice a week and do not cut our scholars' physical activity time. Their life truly depends on it. Thank you. <clears throat> the next one is from Jennifer Thomason and is PE concern. Hello, I just wanted to express my concern for my students and other teachers over the potential of cutting a PE class. My students are very inactive and oftentimes are recess. They choose to sit and talk over running and playing together. I know that this cut to a PE class each week will cut down the amount of active time that they are participating in, which could negatively affect their overall health down the road. I also know that as a teacher, we need each of our preps each day to get parent communication done during the day, get caught up on work to plan ahead, or to hold PLC meetings with our teams. However, if one prep time each week were to be cut, this would also negatively affect teachers during the busyness of the school day and would make it even harder to get all of our work done. Thank you. The next call to public is from Peter Gerlach and says, don't take PE from our scholars. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we have Riley Davidson regarding physical education. Hello, please do not cut a PE to only once a week. Students need more than just one day of PE a week to get out their energy and to exercise. Students only get approximately 15 minutes of time outside for recess a day. This does not include days when it is too hot or too cold outside and they are forced to stay inside. If you were to ask the students which special is their favorite special, Almost all students would say PE because they get to exercise and then they get to play games. Thank you. Next we have Karina Perrin. Subject is please keep PE two times per week. To whom it may concern. My name is Karina Perrin and I have been with the district for five years now. I have taught kindergarten, second and third grade. I have taught hundreds of students over the years and I know how truly important PE is to our scholars and community. Our scholars have gone through so much these past few years. They have been cooped up inside with little to no interaction with other children besides through a screen. Having PE two times per week has so many benefits for our scholars. As a teacher, I see how excited they are to get out and get active and social in the fresh air and sunlight with their peers. The benefits of physical exercise are endless for both the mind and the body. It helps them learn better. Limiting PE to one day per week would be doing a monumental disservice to our scholars. Also, our PE teachers are absolutely incredible. The connections they have made with families and the impact they have had on our community goes beyond words. Cutting 60% of them would be a massive mistake and a true loss to the community. Please do what is best for our children and allow PE to remain on a two time per week schedule. Thank you for your time, Karina Perrin. <clears throat> Next is from Emily Moffitt regarding PE. To whom this may concern, I just wanted to express my concern that students in our district might only be receiving PE once a week starting next school year. PE is a critical component of our students' education. It keeps them healthy, builds confidence in them, and our PE teachers across the district do an amazing job with our scholars. Please reconsider this motion. PE twice a week is so, so important. Thank you and have a great day. Emily Moffat. Next is Mary Lewis regarding PE. Hello, my name is Mary Lewis and this is my first year with the Cartwright School District. However, I have been a teacher for over 10 years. PE is such an important part of a child's education. We as classroom teachers do not have time, have the time to add in fine motor and gross motor skills into our everyday activities. Having PE more than once a week allows students to gain confidence in their bodies and in themselves. We need PE more than once a week, especially in these times when students are asked more and more to just sit and work. They need movement and outdoor time. Please reconsider your idea of having PE once a week and help us teachers invest in our scholars. Thank you, Mary Lewis Kindergarten. Next is Teresa Krausno, special area for students. My name is Teresa Krausno. I have been with the Cartwright family since 2005. I currently teach second grade at Peralta Elementary. I make it my mission to connect with every family I come in contact with. I also teach child development for Estrella Mountain Community College. Making a cut to our special area classes would be detrimental to our students and families, especially cutting our physical education program to only one day a week. 
Our students live in an area that is not conducive to playing outdoors. Going to PE gives our students the much needed physical movement that their body needs to develop and grow appropriately. Growing bodies need gross and fine motor skill practice. Physical education class is sometimes the only physical exercise our students receive. Physical play helps students focus better, learn to control their bodies, burn off excess of energy, and reduce their off-task behaviors. Research shows that students who exercise regularly do better in an academic setting. Please do not approve any cuts to our special areas, music, art, PE. Thank you for making the choice that is best for students, not just our bottom line. Teresa Kresno. Next <clears throat> is Aaron Hicks. The subject is called to the public email from Aaron Hicks. Good evening, Madam President, Governing Board members, and members of the executive team. My name is Aaron Hicks. This is my 21st year teaching in Cartwright. I teach PE and am the lead PE teacher for the district. I teach around 115 scholars per day. I'm teaching out this evening because I am concerned about, I'm reaching out this evening because I am concerned about the proposed reduction of physical education from two sessions per week to one session per week. Our scholars are in dire need of more physical activity, not less. Due to the pandemic, they were home for a year and a half with little opportunity for movement, activity, play, sports, or fitness. Our community has few resources for our students to be physically active. There aren't many parks within our district that our younger students can utilize safely. Much of their physical activity comes from when they are at school and more specifically during their PE class. The following mission statement that was created last year by our PE department, the mission of the Cartwright School District Physical, physical Education Department is to educate minds, develop healthy bodies, and promote positive attitudes towards lifetime physical fitness sorry, physical activity, fitness, and sports skills. Each student will be empowered with the knowledge and skills necessary to make responsible lifestyle choices that directly impact their health and well-being. We will aim to develop the physical, mental, social, and emotional development of each student we serve to be lifelong learners with a desire to stay healthy. We believe 100% in this. We are passionate about our profession. PE is not just about making athletes. We strive to provide physical we strive to provide fitness activities of all types for, to our scholars. We want them to find something they enjoy to help them stay healthy throughout their lifetime. We also teach them about health concepts, nutrition, keeping our heart healthy, and why it is important to instill healthy habits at a young age. Activity not only affects our health, strengthens our muscles and heart, but it is important to our social and emotional well-being. We teach our students that when they are stressed out, overwhelmed, sad, mad, anxious, or overstimulated, that exercise can help with these feelings. Activity helps calm us. During physical education class, the students are learning how to work together, how to problem solve, team building skills, communication skills, and sportsmanship. Along with the physical and social emotional benefits of increased activity, there are numerous studies about the benefits of exercise and learning. The more you move, the more your brain makes connections that help with understanding and learning. Exercise also helps retain the information learned. Our scholars deserve the best all-around education. I've always been proud of the fact that Cartwright strives to educate the whole child. We need to think about what is best for our kids, and right now that is to keep physical education at two sessions per week. Our scholars' health truly depends on it. Thank you for your time, Aaron Hicks. Next is Emmanuel Smith, PE one day a week. Hello, Cartwright board members. My name is Emmanuel Smith. I am currently in my second year of teaching physical education for Cartwright Elementary District. Hearing the news of PE getting cut to one day a week is really devastating, not only for us as teachers, but for our students as well. I believe you will be doing our district a real disservice to all I believe you will be doing our district a real disservice to all in your district by cutting PE to one day a week. PE is the only subject where we are focused on our students' health and physical needs just as much as the cognitive needs. And in our current times of pandemics, both obesity and COVID, our students need to know and learn that their health, physical activity, and foods also play a direct role in keeping their immune system healthy and able to fight illnesses. Lastly, lastly for years, the CDC has strongly recommended that physical education be integrated as a core subject over an elective. Physical education is the only elective when in which students are required to pass in high school in order to graduate. By cutting physical education to one day a week, we are not preparing our students for the requirements in which they will be expected in high school to come to physical education every day, changing into PE uniforms 
and locker rooms and passing physical education in order to graduate. Thank you, Emmanuel Smith. <clears throat> Next is Riley Quintas, Physical Education Advocacy for Scholars. Good morning. I am a third grade teacher at John F. Long Elementary here in the Cartwright School District. I am writing to you on behalf of our scholars and physical education teachers. In my opinion, we would be doing an enormous disservice to our scholars if their PE minutes were to be decreased, especially down to one time a week. Exercise not only promotes a positive physical healthy lifestyle, but aids in their mental health as well. With mental health being more prevalent than it ever has been, I don't know how we can take away another outlet for our scholars. Obesity has always been an issue in children in the United States, but it continues to be on the uphill rise, especially with COVID-19 being such a strong part of our reality. Physical education promotes a healthy lifestyle, teaches the necess necessary qualities to practice good leadership and all around self-discipline. These are not only important skills for our scholars here in our school district, but to be a positive person in society as they graduate and move on to become a part of our society. Riley Kintis. Next, from Karen Himisoti, Cutting PE Classes. Research confirms that healthier students make better learners. Physical education helps students develop a healthy lifestyle. Physical education gives students the chance to socialize and learn skills such as communication, empathy, and respect for others. Students also learn positive team building skills such as cooperation, leadership, and responsibility. Also, they learn to better cope in stressful situations. Increased activity improves mental health and reduces stress. Increased activity causes increased blood flow, which boosts mental performance. Obesity rates have increased in the past two years, and the only activity most children participate in is looking at social media and sitting on the couch playing video games. Decreasing physical education will only make this problem worse. Physical education is important for every child's physical, social, emotional, and cognitive abilities. Please take all of this into consideration when thinking about decreasing physical education class times from our scholars. Respectfully submitted, Karen Himasoti and Kathy Cunningham. Next is from Cassandra Yancey regarding physical education. My name is Cassandra Yancey and this is my 25th year in the district. I teach physical education and throughout my years, student requests PE in high volume. Physical education gives our students an opportunity to exercise their minds, body, and spirit. Exercise allows students of all ages the opportunity to live long, healthier lives and have better brain function because of movement. In our district, these students have taken the activities that they have learned in PE classes and share the activities throughout the community, which involves group exercise and a reduction of obesity. Thank you for listening. Cassandra Yancey. Next is from Elise Skierski regarding PE concern. Hello, I have recently heard some very concerning information about the possibility of cutting PE from two days a week down to one. I am asking for this to not be put in place for many reasons. One, the health of our students is and has been our number one priority. We know that the healthier our bodies are, the more likely, the more likely we are to recover from illness. Two, obesity in our country as a whole has gotten worse, especially due to the pandemic. I have had so many parents reach out to me the past two years because they have been very worried about their children gaining weight. I specifically had a parent that wanted to double check that their child would be getting two days of PE this year. Three, many students do not have the option to get exercise outside of school. Parents work hours that make them unable to go on family bike rides or walks. Many of the students tell me that their parents only let them play inside because it is not safe in their neighborhoods to play outside. Four, <coughs> excuse me. Arizona weather makes it nearly impossible to get exercise during the summer months when students have off of school. Instead of summer being the time when you are outside the most, this is the time in Arizona when people are inside the most due to the heat. Five, mental health has been a massive area of concern, especially the last few years. Exercise and movement are proven to help with mental health. If anything should be changed about physical education, it would be more time needed. Physical health and its importance has never been so crucial than right now. Two, day, two days of PE help support our students in so many ways. I hope these concerns are taken into consideration for our students. With respect, Elise Skierski, Reed. Next is from Allison Waldron regarding PE. My name is Allison Waldron and I have been with the district for seven years. I teach third grade. The thought of losing any specials, but especially PE, even once a week is truly heartbreaking to me. Not only is the loss of our PE teachers frightening, but I see in the students' faces how much they love and need PE in their lives. 
Our students do not always have the opportunity to go play, go outside and play. I do appreciate that hopefully we can partner with PlayWorks. They are amazing. However, nothing can replace the life skills taught through PE or the connections that our PE teachers make with all of the students. I hope we can find an alternative to the proposed solution, as I foresee this being so devastating for staff and students alike. Allison Manneth Waldron. Next is from Jacqueline Torres Martinez and regarding PE concern. It has been brought to my attention that PE will be decreased from one day a week next school year. This is concerning to one day a week next school year. This is concerning to me as our scholars have spent over 16 months at home learning online and not getting enough physical education and or exercise. Our scholars are not able to get exercise in summer because it is too hot outside and in the winter it gets dark early so the amount of exercise is limited. Parents work long hours and are not, are not able to go out on family bike rides or walks. PE is essential to our scholars. They love PE and for most of them it is the only exercise they get. Obesity is a high rate due to the pandemic and a lot of parents are concerned for their children's health. Please take this into consideration. Ms. Martinez. Next is Jelsey Gonzalez. We need PE. Good morning. My name is Jelsey Gonzalez and I am a teacher at John F. Long Elementary School. I am reaching out on behalf of my scholars and our staff. I find it extremely baffling to think the district would want to cut back on the amount of days that students go to PE. After two years, going on to three, struggling with pandemic, it should be crucial that we invigorate our students through our elective courses and that we encourage them to take care of their health at a young age. At our school, we witness many students who are not being taught to take care of their bodies or mental health and emotional health in their homes. It is our responsibility as well to teach that at school. Not only would it be devastating to our scholars that they would not be able to attend their favorite class as much anymore, but it would affect our students' physical and mental well-being, not being able to exercise as much. We have already had issues this year because we lost a PE teacher whom we dearly loved. Therefore, it would be hard on students to lose a day of PE. Exercise is essential during these hard times where we are encouraged to stay home at all times. I really am asking that we keep two days a week in order for our scholars to survive this hard enough school year. Thank you for taking the time to read this email. Kindly, Ms. Gonzalez. Next is from Iris Castillo Contreras. My name is Iris Castillo. I have been with the district for four years. I teach reading interventions. It's important that the students have PE for two times a week because it helps them to release all their energy and keeps them active. Next is from Alex Bark. My name is Alex Bark. I have been with the district for four years and teach general music at Peralta Elementary. I have witnessed firsthand the positive effect that PE has with our students. In addition to giving them physical activity that they need, especially after a year in isolation, our PE teachers go above and beyond to foster a sense of community, both within the school and in the surrounding area. They do everything in their power to incorporate classroom subjects into their lessons, as well as instill in students, excuse me, lifelong lessons of teamwork, respect, and co cooperation. Cutting PE to one day a week would be highly detrimental to the students. They are losing essential life skills and essential activity if this were to take place. Alex Spark. Next is from Christine Mendoza <clears throat> regarding please keep two days week for PE. Hello, my name is Christine Mendoza and I have taught in the Cartwright Elementary School District for 18 years. I teach in the K through six setting and teach approximately 200 scholars each school day. I love my job and love the fact that I have the honor of shaping healthy lifelong habits with all of my scholars. Childhood obesity is at its highest due to the COVID-19 quarantine and now is the best time to continue having physical education class twice a week, especially for the mental, emotional and physical wellness of our scholars. At our school, Peralta Elementary, we host a first, first Thursday fun run each month for scholars and staff to walk, jog or run to help start the school day in a positive way. We have approximately 400 scholars and staff who participate, and it is amazing to see so many scholars excited and wanting to become healthier. The physical education program at Peralta El Elementary also hosts an annual turkey trot that all scholars and staff participate in by walking and jogging for 20 minutes, followed by a 20 minute physical activity time. Our amazing Peralta parents and community are always willing to assist with this event by donating canned goods and any other food items that we raffle off to our scholars at the turkey trot for a Thanksgiving meal. Our PE program wouldn't be complete without 
talking about the outstanding track meet that occurs every year. This event is the highlight of our physical education program, and our scholars are excited to learn new strategies to improve their performance from the preceding years. And now let's talk about the benefits academically for our scholars who receive more physical education time. Students have shown that scholars, sorry, studies have shown that scholars who are more physically active tend to perform better academically. And also in our physical education program at Peralta Elementary, we provide cross-curriculum opportunities for our scholars to assist with the comprehension of math and some social studies concepts throughout all grade levels. So not only does more practicing a positive Sorry. So not only does more physical education time help our scholars perform better academically, it also assists scholars with the learning and practicing on positive social skills. Physical education provides scholars with many opportunities to learn about sportsmanship, the idea of winning and losing, sharing with others, learning and teaching from one another, and communication. Without physical education twice a week, our scholars will not have the same opportunities to practice these social skills, cross-curriculum ideas, and have less physical activity time. With this being said, please consider keeping our two-day-a-week physical education program. Thank you for your time and consideration. Christine Mendoza. Next is from Marissa Pino regarding elective cuts. To whom it may concern. My son is in the LFI program, and these electives daily help him grow and become more independent. Cutting them to one day a week could be damaging to his and other students' way of life. Please reconsider by not cutting these imperative classes. Marissa Pino. Next is Maria Vidal regarding elective classes. Hello, good morning. This is really important to me because my son has a disability and he cannot be sitting for a long period of time. Kids nowadays, all they want to do, all they want is to be working with electronics and don't get their physical activity a day. My son needs his elective classes. He needs to work with different people throughout the day. I know that this is tough for all students, but students need to get their minds off of what's going on around the world and talk with their friends and get their minds going on what would really benefit them. Thank you. Next is from Olivia Lauterbach regarding possible PE cancellation. To whom it may concern, in tonight's governing board meeting, a decision will be made on whether or not the district should switch to one day of PE per week instead of two. I am writing to express my deep concern for this consideration. PE is something that my students look forward to every week. They count down the days until PE. It allows them to get their bodies and minds active. In a world where technology is slowly taking over, I know that my students go home and watch TV or play video games until they go to bed. I rarely hear about my students getting up and playing outside. Although I know that we would although I know that we would still have PE once per week, it is simply not enough. In school, we are taught to give our students brain breaks and a lot of times that includes getting them up and active. PE is a perfect chance to do this. When my students come back from PE, they are ready to learn and more focused. I know that my students will be devastated by this switch if it takes place. Please consider my words. Thank you for your time. Olivia Lauterbach. Next is from Caitlin Halleck, regarding please consider keeping PE class twice a week. My name is Katie Halleck, and I have been with the district for seven years. I teach approximately 200 scholars total every day. I also teach PE to our LFI students on my campus and have taught PE to our REACH students for three years in the past. In addition to teaching, I have devoted my time and effort to coaching. I served as the girls' softball head coach at Harris for one season, and I'm currently in my fourth year as one of the cross-country and track and field coaches at Castro Middle School. I could go on and on explaining why PE is important to our students, but here are the main ones that could stand out to me, especially in the times we currently have all been experiencing. We are coming off a year and a half of distance learning, continued life with COVID-19, and many other factors that have contributed to the mental and physical instability of our scholars. We have been a society that has been told to stay home for over a year. Now more than ever, our scholars need to be moving. They need to find enjoyment in exercise and fitness so that they can grow up with the understanding of why it is important to be aware of not only your physical health, but also your emotional, social, and mental well-being. On top of everything else, our scholars live in an area with limited resources to be active outside of school. Unfortunately, they do not have access to opportunities or support that those scholars in other school districts have. 
PE may be the only time that our scholars run, skip, jump, compete, play, increase their heart rates, etc. We teach sports skills and activities that our scholars may have never even seen or heard of. We teach countless life skills such as teamwork, sportsmanship, and how to have good attitudes all while applying them to activities outside of school. Our mission statement as PE teachers is as follows. The mission of the Cartwright School District Physical Education Department is to educate minds, develop healthy bodies, and promote positive attitudes towards lifetime physical activity, fitness, and sports skills. Each student will be empowered with the knowledge and skills necessary to make responsible lifestyle choices that directly impact their health and well-being. We will aim to develop the physical, mental, social, and emotional development of each student we serve to be lifelong learners with a desire to stay healthy. Cartwright PE teachers have been resilient in our field. We have experienced and continue to experience inadequate facilities, equipment, and temperatures, yet we still show up day in and day out for our scholars. We have PE being taught on a stage in some schools, which is not ideal or safe at all. Yet those teachers still show up and give their scholars the best that they deserve. We put them first always. If PE is cut down to once a week, the well-being of our scholars is not being put first. I foresee many PE teachers leaving the district to pursue their passions elsewhere if this is decided. I also foresee a decrease in the motivation of our students, which is finally being built up after a year and a half of distance learning. Please keep in mind that some scholars come to school just because they have PE that day. We hear this more than once a day, every day. We need to keep the focus on the scholars and what is best for them now, but also how it will affect them in their future endeavors outside of the Cartwright School District number 83. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to my concerns. May you all stay healthy and safe in these trying times we continue to experience. Katie Halleck. Next is Kathy Greaves regarding PE. My name is Kathy Greaves and I have been a PE teacher in Cartwright District since 1980. I understand that there is a budget issue. I just hope our scholars don't have to pay the price. I love Cartwright and have had generations of families, parents, their kids, and their kids. I am very proud of the physical education program that we have provided to our families. Physical education helps our scholars with social skills, mental health, and physical health. We want our scholars to have opportunities to compete with other students, and this will cut their chances in half. It is important to empower scholars with the skills necessary to make responsible lifestyle choices that will directly impact their health and well-being. Please reconsider and allow our scholars to grow having two PE days a week. Remember, a healthy body develops a healthy mind. Thank you, Kathy Greaves. Next is David Bailey. My name is David Bailey. I have been with the district for two years. I teach K through 8th physical education to over 100 students every day, and I strongly believe in fitness. Physical education is a great way to teach students about movement, strategies, teamwork, problem solving, and health related fitness. Students need physical activity on a consistent basis to develop healthy bodies, minds, and spirits. They are also able to build social, psychomotor, and cognitive skills, which can then be utilized in the classroom. In order to encourage students to live healthy, active lifestyles, physical activity needs to be provided as much as possible. To develop healthy routines, day-to-day physical activity is essential. Kind regards, David Bailey. Next is Roxanne Hunt regarding PE in our schools. Hello, my name is Roxanne Hunt. I have been with the district for 16 years. I teach 90 to 100 students every day in sixth grade. Our students need as many opportunities to go outside and run in a safe environment. Many of our students do not go home to run and play in the streets like we used to in the old days. Our scholars go home and hop on YouTube, game systems, or start helping their parents and siblings. They need PE in the daytime. We have taken away so many things from our students, like morning recess, and in some cases, afternoon recess is so short, they barely get a chance to play. PE is not only good for their body's health, but for their mental health. Brains with lots of oxygen and endorphins being used up positively helps them be better learners and less anxious in the classroom. Please fight to keep our PE classes. Our scholars need the class to move and stretch. How you support schools, the community. Thank you for your time and consideration. Super amazing teacher. Roxanne Hunt. Next is Braxton Lanier regarding the importance of PE. The restructuring of a budget and reallocation of funding that is already insufficient is a grossly daunting task most especially when it greatly impacts our students. 
I want to express my gratitude to all stakeholders who are currently working diligently to maintain the integrity of our education system throughout this looming financial hardship coupled with the continuing pandemic barriers. I truly appreciate your dedication to our staff and students. My name is Braxton Lanier, and I'm currently in my first year of employment as a physical education teacher at Cartwright, Davidson, and Sunset Elementary Schools. I have the good fortune of working with truly great great teachers in the physical education department who are dedicated to the health and wellness of all students. According to the CDC, obesity in children is cur currently at 19.3% nationwide, and physical education during a school day is often the only time that many of our students may engage in organized physical activity. Our programming provides a rigorous approach to promoting healthy and active lifestyles that will give students the skills to implement for a lifetime of good health and fitness practices. As we all know, a healthy daily lifestyle most certainly will aid in longevity of life. Development and implementation of a healthy lifestyle is only one component of the, ne of the necessity of a physical education program. Teamwork and leadership skills are a frontline focus for our students as we work with them through activities and game-centered strategies to develop these. We provide them with challenges and obstacles on a daily basis that require hard work, tenacity, critical thinking, and teamwork. I have watched our students exhibit great growth in these skills, and they have much more to gain. Again, these are life skills that will serve our students well regardless of their path in the future. The classroom can be un unintentionally stressful for students and potentially fill them with anxiety. Physical education provides students with the much needed exertion of energy to clear their minds and allow the endorphins to thrive. Exercise within the school day allows students to reset and regain focus for learning upon return to the classroom. Also, physical activity will help to provide a restful night's sleep for resuming education in the morning for maximum learning potential. We have all been victimized by the pandemic in one way or another. We know that stress and trauma are direct impacts for our students and physical activity each day is one way of helping to cope with any negative consequences from our current situation. Lastly, many times with children, negative behaviors are a di direct result of pent up frustration and excess energy due to numerous due to numerous variables. Many studies have shown that a positive release of energy along with structured physical activity is preventative and proactive with potential negative behaviors or acting out that can disrupt learning. Our students have already experienced more change than we would wish for them in a lifetime. Due to no fault of their own, we have altered their entire school experience in so many ways that have caused stress and uncertainty in their world. I respectfully ask that our physical education program remain intact so that we can continue to serve our students both physically and healthfully while simultaneously providing opportunities for teamwork and leadership skills, behavior management, and stress and anxiety relief. Next is Michelle Radvansky regarding Please Save Our Students PE. Thank you for taking the time to read this. My name is Michelle Radvansky. I have been in the district for 21 years. In middle schools, PE is the first and second student choice for electives. PE holds the largest class numbers, sub extra classes, and provides student support. Some students only come to school because they love their PE class. It is proven PE helps the students focus during seat time and lowers anxiety levels. PE helps students develop personally, socially, and physically. It promotes the overall health and wellness of the students for current and future years. Students need more activity during the day, not less. Cutting PE is not in the best interest of our students. Thank you. Next is Molly Murphy regarding students benefit from PE in many ways. Hello, my name is Molly Murphy and I have taught PE in the Cartwright District for 19 years. When I first began at Borman, PE was five days a week for all scholars and now there is talk of cutting it to one day per week. Physical activity has been shown in study after study to increase brain activity, thus resulting in higher test scores. Both kids and adults who are in better, better physical condition are less likely to suffer more serious effects of COVID-19. PE is an integral part of a well-rounded scholar and our scholars need to be in a physically active class learning the importance of exercise, nutrition, and hygiene. Thank you for your time and consideration, Molly Murphy. Next is Jessica Guzman regarding PE call to the public. My name is Jessica Guzman. I have been with the district for 16 years. I teach sixth grade. I want to address the importance of PE to our scholars 
It is critical that they are provided the opportunity to shine in PE while at school. Often there are a few students in our classes that shine in this part of the educational system while struggling to shine in other areas. It is critical that students are provided the opportunity to have this collaborative time together in order to grow socially, physically, and academically. Sincerely, Ms. Guzman. Next is Denise Havers. My name is Denise Havers. I have been with the district for 21 years. I feel that it would be a critical loss for our scholars to lose PE even by one day. Why would you want to take that outside activity and exercise away from them? They love it too much. Please reconsider. Thank you. Next is Ayat Asi. Regarding PE days, my name is Ayat Asi and I am an employee of ESI, a company that hires substitutes to provide for numerous districts around the valley. Currently, I am working as a long-term substitute at Peralta Elementary School with Cartwright District. I recently heard about the possibility of lessening PE days for the students from two days a week to one day. I respectfully would like to say that I disagree with this decision for several reasons. First, if a student catches COVID and has to quarantine, they typically do not get any exercise for those two weeks they are away from school. When they come back, the two days of exercise during PE greatly help their bodies after recovery and get them to be fit again. Secondly, students are experiencing grief and stress, not only due to the events occurring around us, but because they are losing their own family members to the sickness as well. As everyone knows, exercise is a great way to de-stress and has been scientifically proven to increase dopamine, the feel-good chemical. Thirdly, this would impact the teachers' careers as they may have to be laid off. That is not good for them or our schools. Many students enjoy their PE teachers and find them to be fun, and we have some great teachers. Please turn this possibility into... I'm going to have to read it as it was listed on here. Please turn this possibility into an impossibility. That makes sense. Two PE days are needed for everyone. Thank you very much in advance for your time and consideration. Kind regards, Ms. Ayat. Next is Leah Zapetta regarding PE concern. Good evening. My name is Leah Zapetta. I have taught in the district for 11 years and have two daughters that are scholars that attend Peralta. It has been brought to my attention that the board is considering cutting PE to one day a week. As a parent and a teacher, I find this to be very concerning and upsetting. Our children need to have PE twice a week. As a social and emotional learning district, we understand that all children are different and excel in various areas, such as PE. Our scholars learn both social and emotional skills in PE, such as problem solving and leadership skills. In a research article by Active Living, the key finding is that physical activity can have both immediate and long-term benefits on academic performance. Almost immediately after engaging in physical activity, children are better able to concentrate on classroom tasks, which can enhance learning. Over time, as children engage in developmentally appropriate physical activity, their improved physical fitness can have additional positive effects on academic performance in mathematics, reading, and writing. Recent evidence shows. How Recent evidence shows how physical activities' effects on the brain may create these positive outcomes. How can we justify cutting PE when there are so many positive outcomes for our children? As a parent, I do not want my own children to only have PE once a week. Distance learning took so much away from them, especially physical activity. Do not take away something that makes such a positive impact in their lives. As the research article states, there is a growing body of evidence indicating that physical activity and fitness can benefit both health and academic performance for children. Physical activity and fitness help school-age children maximize their academic performance. Both childhood obesity and poor academic performance tend to be clustered in schools with a high percentage of lower-income minority students, creating a student health issue that is especially problematic in those communities. Physical education is beyond beneficial to our scholars, our children, and all aspects of our lives. Why ruin a good thing? Thank you. Leah Zapetta. <clears throat> Next is... Avani Shaw regarding physical education. My name is Avani Shaw, and I have been with Cartwright School District for 10 years now. I do not believe we should be cutting PE classes to only one time a week as our students benefit from daily PE classes as a form of exercise and a way to release energy. If this is what the district is planning for the, upcom for the upcoming year, then this will be a detriment to many of our students. Thanks, Ms. Shaw. Next is Kerrigan Sablik regarding PE. To whom it may concern, I believe that Cartwright School District number 83 should keep physical education two days a week for a total of 80 minutes a week. 
Many students are inactive during school and home hours, and PE is a great outlet for students to be active. Students also learn communication, social, and social skills. Without PE two days a week, students will not be able to grow on these skills and have an outlet during the school day. Thank you, Kerrigan Subleek. Next is Melissa Mont regarding PE concern. To whom it may concern. I am emailing to express my concern for cutting PE to once a week. I have been at Cartwright for five years and PE is one of the most important specials that my students attend. Over the past years, PE has not only been a chance for students to move their bodies, but has taught students the importance of caring for their health and their surroundings. PE has also taught students how to be a good teammate, friend, and scholar. I believe that PE is a vital part to students' educational experience and cutting it to once a week will hinder their time to grow not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. Thank you for your time, Melissa Mont. Next is Pat Reeves regarding PE concern. Hello, my name is Pat Reeves. I have worked in the district for 26 years. I have a grandson that attends Peralta. Our PE teachers at Peralta are the best. Our students love learning with them. Our children have been stuck inside learning from a computer for too long. Now that they are back in school, we need to give them the opportunity to interact with one another and learn social skills outside of the classroom, something that many of them are truly struggling with. Many of our students, my grandson included, rely on PE as their only source of physical activity. As parents and grandparents, we teach our children the importance of eating right and exercising. What message are we sending them when we take away a day of physical activity each week for monetary reasons? Having PE only one day a week is unacceptable. Do not take this away from our children. Thank you, Pat Reeves. Next is from Candy Montoya regarding physical education two times a week. Hello. I believe our scholars need as much physical activity as possible. Physical education provides cognitive content and instruction designed to develop motor skills, knowledge, and behaviors for physical activity and physical fitness. Having PE at least two times a week provides students with the ability and confidence to be physically active for a lifetime. Thank you, Candy Montoya. Next is Francesca Dugar. It's imperative that these children have an outlet to let and some source of regularity in these ever-changing times. Next is Audrey Brassel regarding PE. My name is Audrey Brassel. I have been with the district for four years and I have been teaching self-contained special education for all four years. PE is one of the very few classes that our staff, PE is one of the very few classes that our self-contained students can actually join in so that they can be part of a general education class for one period a day. PE is one place where the self-contained students can participate in sports since they are not able to stay after school. They are not able to stay for after school sports because they need specialized transportation. Next is Linda Brown. Please don't cut elective classes. Dear Cartwright School Board President and members, I am a special education teacher in the Cartwright District. This is my 21st year of teaching. I started as a resource teacher and now teach students with mild to moderate disabilities in a self-contained LFI class. It is so important for our self-contained students to have a consistent schedule that includes elective classes such as adaptive PE, adaptive music, art, STEM, culinary, etc. The elective classes really help our students develop social skills as they learn new activities. The elective teachers who work with the students are very instrumental in helping all students cope with situations they face at school and at home. They form special relationships with these students that would be jeopardized if they only see the students one day a week. I ask that you search for other areas for budget cuts rather than having the elective classes only one day a week at the middle school level. Thank you for your time, Linda Brown. Next is Jennifer Ramirez, <coughs> excuse me, regarding PE. Jennifer Ramirez, kinder teacher. Please consider how important PE is for our students. PE not only improves motor skills and engages students in healthy activity, but it also contributes to a child's growth and development. It reduces stress, tension, and anxiety. Regular exercise is also vital in the fight against child obesity. PE helps students perform better academically because physical activity improves concentration and helps our students maintain focus. Please consider all these positive benefits of having two PE periods per week before making your decision. <clears throat> Next is Savannah Jensen regarding physical education advocacy. To whom it may concern, 
My name is Savannah Jensen, and I am a PE teacher at Manuel Pena Junior Elementary. I have been at Pena for three years and in the Cartwright District for four. Each day I have the opportunity to teach 200-plus amazing scholars. As I have been here, I have had the pleasure to watch scholars grow mentally and physically in their physical education classes. I have also been witness to confidence boosts and friendships made. Physical education is not only a time to decrease your risk of chronic illnesses, but guide scholars to adopt and maintain health-enhancing skills that they can use for a lifetime. Taking away one day of physical education means a decrease in mental and physical health, loss of confidence, and an increase in sedentary lifestyles. Following COVID, I have witnessed students who are scared and unsure how to move. Distant learning showed me how... Distance learning showed me that we cannot lose days or even seconds to help support these students to live active lifestyles. If this trend continues, our future generations risk morality in their adult years. I ask that you please take into consideration our scholars' needs. Many students rely on physical education as their only source of movement. I would suggest more physical education rather than less. Our students, families, and generations to come deserve to learn how to better their health both mentally and physically, in physical education class two plus days a week. Thank you for taking the time to read my concerns, Savannah Jensen. Next is Leslie Ballon regarding cutting PE. My name is Leslie Ballon and I have been with the district for 15 years. I currently teach intervention to approximately 70 eighth graders each day. Hearing that the district is planning on cutting PE to one day per week, which in turn would eliminate 60% of the PE staff, is extremely concerning. Research has proven that regular exercise is vital in the fight against childhood obesity. Students who exercise regularly are better able to concentrate and maintain focus, have improved self-discipline, and have improved behavior in school. Our students love PE. It is the most requested elective we have, and our PE staff goes above and beyond their job description to ensure quality physical education and to provide extra support with behaviors and the staff coverage issues that our district struggles with. Without every single one of them, our district will take a tremendous blow. PE is a four-day elective, and the PE staff are instrumental to the success of our children, and I sincerely hope the district reconsiders cutting the program just to save a buck. Thank you, Leslie Ballon. <clears throat> Next is Mario Hernandez regarding call to the public. Hello, my name is Mario Hernandez. I have been with the district for 16 years. I teach physical education to about 200 students at Peralta Elementary. Physical education is the heart of the school reaching every single student at Peralta. Taking away a day of PE from our scholars would be catastrophic. Physical education teachers, scholars, Physical education teaches scholars social skills, group work, and problem solving, life skills that are not possible in the classroom due to such tight schedules. Physical education provides cognitive content and instruction designed to develop motor skills, knowledge, and behaviors for physical activity and physical fitness. The past year has shown us that health is the most important thing we have, and cutting PE by a day is only going to hurt our scholars' future. If we truly care about what is best for our students, we need to reconsider. <clears throat> Next is Carmine Fortunato regarding physical education. Hello, my name is Carmine Fortunato. I have been with the district for four years now. I get to directly teach approximately 200 students every day. Indirectly, I get to have a positive impact on the entire school. I am sure we all know by now how physical education improves cognitive function and the impact which that has on a student's academic success. Something that I got to see when teaching is the students cooperating with each other in an organized movement. Almost every day I witness heartwarming moments of students helping their classmates when they fail instead of bringing them down. When one of their classmates falls, they are there to pick them up. When one of their classmates isn't quite getting the skill we are learning, a student who is proficient demonstrates it for them and walks them through it, literally taking my job. The social emotional learning that takes place in physical education is a different form than that in the classroom. It comes to life where the students get to develop and practice life skills, which will make them good citizens. If you think about when you observed a physical education class, this remains evident. It is physically observable. Hopefully, this is one aspect of physical education that I bring your attention to out of the innumerable benefits that it has on students. Our kids will be impacted a great deal if physical education is cut. Thank you, Carmine Fortunato. Next is Anne Henning regarding PE classes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. 
My name is Anne Henning, and I have been working in Cartwright for five years. I am a gifted resource teacher. I heard about the possibility of decreasing PE classes to only once per week. I wholeheartedly disagree with this. Children are becoming more and more sedentary with every new video game that is produced. Physical education is one way to combat this lifestyle. We need to keep our scholars moving and active. There are numerous benefits to physical activity and a great deal of research behind this. Here are a few reasons to support my decision. Increased physical activity leads to increased academic performance. Physical education classes help to develop motor skills, teach self-discipline, help develop student responsibility for health and fitness, leadership skills, cooperation and team building, which is applicable not only in the classroom but later in life, in collegiate and career settings. Physical education reduces stress, releases tension and anxiety, helps to build stronger peer relationships, improves self-confidence and self-esteem along with respect for your body, classmates, and teammates. There are so many benefits, both immediate and long longevity, to having physical education several times per week. I suggest that we increase the amount of classes as opposed to decreasing them. In a nutshell, PE is good for the mind, body, and spirit. Thank you for your time and consideration. Respectfully, Anne Henning. <clears throat> Next is Andre Billman regarding advocacy for physical education. To whom it may concern, my name is Andre Billman. I have been teaching physical education in the district for eight years. Each day, I have the pleasure of teaching 200 plus scholars. Through teaching physical education, I've been able to see scholars grow mentally, physically, and emotionally. In my classroom, students learn how to move and keep their bodies healthy, but also teamwork, resiliency, problem solving, how to manage their emotions, goal setting, and other life skills. Physical education does five things for our scholars. One, makes them better learners, when the body is active, the brain is active. Two, fights disease and its sickness. Three, enhances their mood. Four, help them maintain a healthy weight. Five, develop stronger muscles, bones, and joints. By limiting physical education to one day per week, scholars will be losing out on these opportunities to develop physically, mentally, socially, and emotionally, as well as increase their risk of developing chronic diseases. Please reconsider your proposal to reduce physical education to once a week. The mission of the Cartwright School District Physical Education Department is to educate minds, develop healthy bodies, and promote positive attitudes towards lifetime physical activity, fitness, and sports skills. Each student will be empowered with the knowledge and skills necessary to make responsible lifestyle choices that directly impact their health and well-being. We will aim to develop the physical, mental, social, and emotional development of each student we serve to be lifelong learners with the desire to stay healthy. Andre Billman. Next is Christian Liebman regarding concern for shortening PE. To whom this may concern. I am a fourth grade teacher at Palm Lane. As you can imagine, this week has been hectic with everything going on, but after hearing that PE may be cut down from two days to one, I had some serious concerns. One major concern I have with this is that this would mean a section slash PE teacher would need to be cut from our school. With times as hard as they are right now due to the pandemic, I understand cuts are going to need to be made, but I'm not sure starting with PE teachers is a great starting point. A lot of teachers within the district are worried for their job security after hearing about nearby districts such as Glendale closing schools in full. Once cuts begin to be made, this is going to lower morale throughout the district. I always try to find the positive in a situation, but I'm having a hard time with this one. My number one concern about this possibility is of course for the students' sake. According to the CDC in 2018, obesity prevalence was 25.6% among Hispanic children, 24.2% among non-Hispanic black children, 16.1% among non-Hispanic non white children, and 8.7% among non-Hispanic Asian children. This research is from four years ago before the pandemic. Not only are we behind academically, socially, and emotionally, but these kids are behind physically too. Cutting their physical education will definitely not allow them to improve on, improve on themselves outside of the classroom. This also means that they will lose the majority of their health lessons that they receive each year since they would have only one day a week. They, aren't, they already don't get enough of these lessons to the point where myself as a classroom teacher, I have considered doing this since it's starting to be a subject matter of the past. I do understand that I am unaware of all of what is going on on your end, and I'm sure you all have the best intentions, 
but I just wanted to try and throw in a couple of points that must be considered. Again, I'm sure with heavy hearts you have considered these points, but I just wanted you to know a lot of students will be heartbroken by this news if you choose to cut PE. Thank you for your time. Christian Liebman. <clears throat> Next is Allison Pang regarding call to the public. Happy Thursday. My name is Allison Pang, and this is my fifth year of teaching at Peralta Elementary. In my experience, PE is so important to the well-being of our scholars, and if we have their best interests in mind, our district should keep PE twice a week. After this past year, we know how much health is a priority, and PE is often the only time scholars are exercising. PE is also crucial to social development, problem solving, and developing motor skills. Once a week is simply not enough. Also, in my experience, the PE teachers are the backbone of the school, running special events and taking extra classes when another specials teacher is sick. Thank you for the consideration, and I hope we can keep two days of PE. <coughs> Next is Sarah Underwood regarding concern over possible change to PE. I was informed that there is the possibility of cutting PE from two times a week to one time a week. I am asking that this change is not implemented for several reasons. First, I believe that obesity is an issue in the U.S. that has gotten worse with the pandemic. PE helps students have physical activity and be healthier. Second, some students cannot exercise after school due to parents keeping them inside due to safety concerns. Finally, physical activity helps improve mental health, which is especially needed now with the pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Respectfully, Sarah Underwood. Next is Samuel Tucker regarding PE cancellation. <clears throat> to whom it may concern. I am emailing to express my concern for cutting physical education to once a week. I have been at Cartwright for five years and physical education is one of the most important MAP classes that my students attend. Over the past years, physical education has not only been a chance for students to move their bodies, but has taught students the importance of caring for their health and their surroundings. Physical education has also taught students how to be a good teammate, friend, and scholar. I believe that physical education is a vital part to students' educational experience, and cutting PE to once a week will hinder their time to grow, not only physically, but mentally and emotionally. Thank you for your time, Samuel Tucker. Next is Brian Ballack, our students, sorry, regarding our students need to move, don't cut PE. Our Cartwright students need to move more and cutting PE will do the opposite. Thank you for your time, Brian Bellig, G. Frank Davidson Physical Education Teacher since 2006. Taken from Source, National Survey of Children's Health 2007 Data Resource Center. One, Arizona ranks 25 in overall pre prevalence with cert, sorry everybody. One. Arizona ranks 25 in overall prevalence with 30.6% of children considered either overweight or obese. Two, the Arizona prevalence of overweight and obese children has risen since 2003. Three, according to the 2008 Pediatric Nutrition Surveillance System, which assesses weight status of children from low-income families participating in Arizona, WIC, 30.6% of low-income children aged two to five are overweight or obese in Arizona. Four, Percent overweight or obese by Hispanic origin in Arizona, 41.4%. Hispanic here is defined as ethnicity and compares those who self-identify as Hispanic with all individuals who do not self-identify as Hispanic. Five, percent overweight or obese by non-Hispanic in Arizona, 23.2%. From the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention CDC website, children and adolescents ages 6 through 17 should do 60 minutes, one hour, or more of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity each day, including daily aerobic and activities that strengthen bones like running or jumping three days each week and that build muscles like climbing or doing push-ups three days each week. Next is Juliana Emmett regarding PE cuts. To whom it may concern. My name is Juliana Emmett and I teach sixth grade. Each day, I work with 90 students to ensure they have the tools necessary to be the best scholar and future citizen they can be. I have observed many students in my life, and as, and as of recent, with everything that COVID has taken from them, taking yet another joy from their lives would be detrimental. PE is more than just exercise for kids. Here are direct quotes from my sixth graders on what PE means to them. P 
PE helps me to relax and focus on being in shape, I'd like to set goals and make myself better. PE means I get to move and run and take out my stress. PE helps me stay in shape and spend time with all of my friends. PE, PE means a lot to me because I get to run, spend time with my friends, and move. PE helps me stay awake and feel less tired for school. PE helps me with my soccer outside of school, too. I like to run. PE helps me want to be athletic and outside. PE helps me find a sport that I like. PE is a fun place to be and relax and unwind from all of the work. PE means a lot to me and it helps me be athletic. I don't like being bored at school and PE hypes me up. School is already so much for students. Between the academic pushes and workload to the social challenges of this new generation, don't give them less time doing what they look forward to and love to do. You would be hindering their physical and mental health. I hope you reconsider before making this unnecessary and rash decision. If not for the teachers, then don't do it to the students. Best, Juliana Emmett. <clears throat> Next is Heather Marsh. Regarding Board Meeting 113.22, Physical Education. My name is Heather Marsh. I have been teaching physical education for seven years, the past two years with Cartwright Elementary School District. Physical education plays an important role in our scholars' mental and physical health, but also their academic success. The mental health of students is improved through physical education by allowing students to reduce anxiety, stress, help students improve self-esteem, and it also gives students the ability to work together on a team. Physical education gives our scholars the opportunity to be physically active with their classmates, which can help students make friends and help with any feelings of isolation or loneliness. Physical education has been proven to play a key role in our students' brain development. Exercise can improve problem-solving skills, help students retain information they're taught, and perform better on tests. Physical education has also been linked to improve attention span during class. Physical education benefits the students not only physically, but academically as well. I hope you will reconsider the proposal and continue providing our students with phys physical education twice a week. Thank you for your time. Next is Jane Quartermain regarding PE in the Cartwright School District. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Jane Quartermain. I have been employed by the Cartwright School District for 31 years. I've heard of the proposal by the district to reduce physical education for our students by 50%. I heartily disagree with this idea. PE is vital for the health and well-being, both physically and mentally, of our students. Two of the three district goals, expanding academic achievement and promoting social-emotional learning, are advanced through PE and the educators who teach it. To learn more about the advantages of a strong physical education program, I urge you to read the CDC's recommendations on physical education at um, https colon backslash backslash www.cdc.gov backslash healthy schools backslash physical activity backslash physical dash education dot htm. Cartwright has a long history of prioritizing the education of the whole child. Please continue doing so by maintaining our students' access to PE. Sincerely, Jane Quartermain. <clears throat> Next is Julianne Graves. Hello, my name is Julianne Graves. I am the MAUR Move On When Reading and Reading Interventionist at Peralta Elementary. I strongly disagree with moving PE to only one day a week for our students. PE not only promotes a healthy lifestyle, but it builds so many social skills that our students desperately need. I urge you to reconsider this proposal. Sincerely, Julianne Graves. That is the end of our call to the public for the evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> And no more phone calls, Christine? Linda? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so for now we're going to move on to our item E, which is action items. I mean, it is agendized. No, you may not. 
But it's not an actual action item. So no. Just to clarify, we can't respond at all because the item is on the agenda, but it is not an action item. So we can direct staff um, for discussion at a future meeting date, but we do have it up for discussion this evening. Had it been an action item? Yes. Yeah, so my apologies. You can, however, speak on the, the item during the discussion item itself, if, if respectfully. Thank you. Madam President. <coughs> Yes. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you mentioned that this um, item was on the agenda. I, I couldn't find it. It's in the reorganization of the schools. So it's not an action item, it's a discussion item. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what uh, um, letter? What? Discussion Why didn't I just H? use my paper one? Sorry, I put my paper one. H. It's H. H. It's like at the bottom part. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to item E under action items. The first item is <clears throat> the approval of the 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 Cartwright School District calendars. Am I on the right item? Oh, it's right here. Okay, sorry. My apologies. All right, so I would like to make a motion for approval of the 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 Cartwright School District school calendars at the Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board regular meeting of January 13th, 2022. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. So we do have a motion made by myself, <clears throat> a second made by Governing Board Member Ms. Lydia Hernandez. Any discussion? <coughs> Sorry, I still have my mask off. We'll move on to our roll call vote. Ms. Lydia Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Vice President Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abathia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Abathia. Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote aye as well, and the motion carries. Yay. <clears throat> so item two is the approval to suspend the two reading requirement for policy BGB, policy adoption for an emergency reading discussion information and possible adoption of proposed Cartwright School District new policy, GBQ professional support staff, support staff telecommuting and exhibit GBQE professional support staff telecommuting. By suspending policy BGB, policy adoption, the board will have the opportunity to adopt at a single meeting of the board in a board declared emergency in order to discuss, consider, and adopt the proposed new Cartwright School District policy, GBQ, professional support staff telecommuting, and exhibit GBQE, professional support staff telecommuting, as listed in item E4. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion, sorry. <coughs> For clarification, it's E3. My apologies, everyone. I'm okay? Okay. Yes, so it is agenda item E3. 
So I'd like to make a motion for approval to suspend the two reading requirement for policy BGB, policy adoption for an emergency reading, discussion, information, and possible adoption of proposed Cartwright School District new policy, GBQ, professional support staff telecommuting and exhibit GBQE, professional support staff telecommuting at the Cartwright Elementary School District regular meeting of January 13th, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by uh, Governing Board Member, Ms. Denise Garcia. Any discussion? Go ahead, Ms. Hernandez. Madam President, fellow board members, um, executive team, Dr. Lawler, and those watching, um, I have a question. The, uh, there's two items in the one. So, but I just want to clarify to understand, to, to understand this, make sure I'm understanding that BGB policy adoption, we're changing it. So one thing is to um, not adhere to the, to the former policy, which allows for the due diligence of reading, you know, to have a first read, having you time, time to contemplate and coming back in case you have questions. So the action is to change that, to stop that activity in order to, I don't think it, it, it's written that way, but what I'm hearing is that in order for us to be able to adopt the new policy, which is number three, my question then, then becomes, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, why is there a need to suspend the, uh, the way in which we discuss things is, what is the urgency? Is it because of this, just this one policy? Um, thank you, that's a good question, board president, members of the governing board audience, special guest, and um, board member Hernandez. Uh, the last uh, two weeks have been extremely difficult. The Omicron has just caused uh, staffing um, to be very scarce. And we had talked about a telecommuting policy um, that we were gonna adopt this spring for the upcoming school year. However, we decided that based on principals and assistant principals, as you can see, they're not all here um, because they have to stay home and quarantine and uh, different members of our entire district, um, they at this time cannot telecommute. They cannot work from home, even though they might have minor symptoms, we don't want them coming. And so um, in order to be able to say, starting tomorrow, uh, we have a virtual admin meeting that we can actually ask our admin who are not sick, that can actually work from home and not um, infect anyone or bring anyone the coronavirus, um, but still get work done. And so this is the reason why we would like to suspend the policy with the first and second read for this particular policy because of the emergency situation that we're in right now. Thank you. And thank you for that. And, and just and to just to your um, to your point, um, I want to I, I do I want to make sure that I hear the word suspend. I see it written. Does that mean that it's it is only for the duration of this, and uh, we will have to come back though and re-vote on that policy. Uh, I'm just, uh, it does concern me. Uh, I understand the basis and reasoning for it, and I'm thinking, I know we discussed the telecommuting at a meeting in July or August. Um, and so we've had time to adopt it. I'm just thinking, why is it at the risk and what, where I have the concern is, this is a very critical um, policy in that it allows for due diligence and it allows for feedback of parents, you know, state members, groups. As it is, the agenda, as stated, I think at the beginning, uh, when, where we post the agendas, the introduction talks about uh, even material be being available, you know, 24 hours in advance. But for somebody like me, if I work full time, depending on that schedule and if I work late, it limits me within those 24 hours to be able to, to be prepared for this next meeting when it's posted at 5.30, you know, the day, the day before, allowing um, for the 24 hours, but it's short. 
but it, I'm just, I don't want to, um, I'm just fearful of, want to continue allowing for that due diligence. I want to make sure not, I, unless I see some language that, that will assure that this is a policy that we're not just going to do away with and then leave this way. It's an important and critical part to the whole, the way we, you know, make decisions and discussions. Thank you. Uh, board president, members of the governing board, uh, Ms. Um, Hernandez audience, thank you so much. We did take this to our district attorneys um, because we had the same concern. We wanted to make sure that it was just for this particular policy. And again, uh, not knowing about the Omicron and being able to be in person, we felt that as we move forward with our calendar changes and some of the things that we're doing to save money in the future, that waiting for the telecommuting um, policy to go into effect um, as spring break was really the right time. Not anticipating the Omicron and feeling um, like it was very, it's been very challenging for our staff members to be able to work from home. They have to call out a sick day, um, but yet they're still working. And as a superintendent, I want to ensure that I'm not being unfair to people. And so this is something that we felt was a huge emergency to do at this particular meeting. It would have been great to be in policy as of last Monday, <laughs> prior when we first got back, but having to wait for this meeting, um, we felt we could get through it. But there are so many things that need to get done. Um, and obviously we want people to be in person but because of the situation that we're in right now, it has been very challenging. And we need to call on people to be able to work um, from home as long as they're not sick. So I hope that the board understands that. And it is just for this particular um, approval for the next policy for telecommuting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Luller. <clears throat> Sorry. Fellow members of the board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, cabinet, everyone in attendance, and everyone who is participating via Zoom. It is just for the one time, because we do have the need um, in a much more urgent manner than we did previously. So hopefully that removes the hesitancy because it is just for the one policy. <clears throat> I'm sorry, all that reading got my, <clears throat> I'm gonna lose my voice. Any other discussion? I'm going to, go ahead, Mr. Lopez. Yes. Excuse me, thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team, and those in the audience. If, I, I think prior to the, to the release of the agenda to, to the board, I, I was going to ask for a follow-up on, on this telecommuting policy, uh, something that we can use for the employees. Um, I know that if if you test positive on a home kid, then you have to go home and quarantine, but then you do a PCR and you come out negative. So, I mean, I I went through that last week. I have tested positive on a home kid, but, you know, I did two PCR tests and I came out negative uh, on those. So, Having a policy like this, I think it's it's needed. It's it's needed, and I think hopefully, um, my my ask down the line is if if we can get a report to the board, whether it, it is through the executive content, through board docs, or or at another board meeting, on some of the accountability measures or or other protocols that go into working from home for the employees, um, it, it's. I think it's needed so that we're, we can all be on the same page when it comes to the expectations 
of employees being able to work from home uh, and not taking a sick day uh, or a few sick days, five to be exact, um, so that we can continue to support either the district or the schools on the matter. I know this is such an emergency situation right now that we're uh, discussing at the moment, but I'm, I'm hoping that Dr. Lawler with the executive team can share with the board at another time um, just some of the uh, accountability measures, again, that are coming along with this policy because we don't have any of those in place right now going through the policy. The, the two documents that we have, I was reviewing them, and we do have um, expectations or a protocol, but I think it's um, we just have other questions beyond that. So if we can work on that at, at a future time, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Um, board President, members of the Governing Board, um, Vice President Lopez, um, audience, special guest, I absolutely agree. This is a, we've never had one of these policies before. And so we're learning as well how that's going to look in a school district where you actually need a physical, you know, teacher in front of the scholars, how that'll look. But we do have uh, other positions either at the school or the district that um, we can uh, work from home. Uh, nothing like the last two weeks, uh, principal uh, stuck at home that was working from home, but they still had to take the sick day. I see the, <laughs> and they still had to organize and do all of those things. And so um, not just our amazing school leaders, but so many people, teachers as well, if, if they weren't anticipating, and we know we are, as a teacher, and we were, I was one of them, we always had that sub plan, emergency plan ready to go. But um, sometimes um, there's more that they can be done. So we will, it's gonna be a work in progress to see, and I think that's a really great idea to be able to bring back how that's working, how we're implementing, how we can extend it even beyond um, for our staff and our, our, um, our staff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Lillar. And thank you, Mr. Lopez and Ms. Hernandez. Any other discussion before we make another motion? <clears throat> okay. Yes, Madam President, fellow board members. Just before moving forward, um, and, and again to the same point, I just want to clarify that I don't have an issue with the, with the telecommuting. It's really um, at the at the Arizona State House. You're always weary. Maybe I'm traumatized. You you see. Um, somebody proposing a certain language, let's say, for example, the driver's license. It's not even the driver's license yet. And so you change your wording in the existing policy. And next session around, you're expanding on it because the road, you know, the, uh, the road is open. For my, my purposes, it's, I, I, uh, I feel very strongly about the due diligence and allowing the time to be able to contemplate, discuss, because that's what we're here to do. But thank you for that clarification. So as long as it's that temporary, thank you. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members, executive team. Al alongside uh, to that topic, you know, I would hope that we can revisit the, the needs of the students as well, uh, laptops, hotspots, IT, uh, because if we are going to have our teachers, work, you know, that can work from home that are not having any symptoms, that the classroom is not going virtual, as many districts are doing. I mean, Paradise Valley is, you know, touting, you know, going fully virtual again uh, due to what's happening in that side of town. You know, I would hope that we can, again, revisit our IT needs, uh, making sure the laptops are, are ready to go home or, or hotspots. This is, again, probably going back to when we first shut down the schools and we went home uh, and did virtual learning. I mean, I know it's we don't want to go that, that route, but um, we learned from that. And I'm hoping that if needed to, we can be fully ready and prepared to dispatch everything that is needed for the students at home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. <clears throat> All right, so I would like to make a motion for approval to suspend the two reading requirement for this meeting only for policy BGB, policy adoption for an emergency reading discussion information and possible adoption of proposed Cartwright School District new policy GBQ, professional support staff telecommuting, and exhibit GBQE, professional support staff telecommuting, at the January 13th, 2022, Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board regular meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. 
So we do have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Vice President Lopez. <coughs> we don't need further discussion. We'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? You did you did mention the word temporary in there or something? Okay. Oh, I I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, uh, aye. Thank you. Vice President Lopez. Aye. Thank you. Governing Board Member Abathia. Aye. Thank you. And Governing Board Member Garcia. I vote aye. Thank you. I vote aye as well, and the motion carries unanimously. Yay. So moving on to... Okay. All right, so item three is now Ms. Victoria Farrar for the emergency reading, discussion, information, and possible adoption of Cartwright School District new policy GBQ. Professional Support Staff Telecommuting and Exhibit GBQE, Professional Support Staff Telecommuting. Thank you. Good evening, Board President, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, members of the executive team, and everyone in attendance. Uh, a lot of the discussions has happened. This is a formal policy, this is actually modeled by something that other districts have done with their telecommuting policies, and this does have some very strict requirements. There's logs that need to be filled out by the employees that are working at home, and the, the principles, we did speak to this at CAN on Wednesday, yesterday is Wednesday, that explains that all of the time sheets and the time cards that are entered in Kronos have to be verified by the administrators, so there is a set you know measures for checks and balances on this to make sure that everyone's, you know, adhering to the rules that are specified. The difference between this and when we went to virtual before was we, it was a mandate that we all go, go home to work. This is optional, so this is a lot different. So th there are, you know, definitely more, you know, strict rules involved with this. And this is something, you know, in light of the pandemic, this is another measure that we're offering to those that, that can. I mean, obviously, not everyone can work remotely. Some of the positions that we have don't afford that opportunity, but for those that can, it's, you know, it's a morale thing, too. And, you know, we, we're going to electric buses for a reason. We have a lot of pollution, a lot of asthma. There's a lot of benefits, knowing, especially knowing that now we can work virtually and still make a Zoom meeting and, and our staff meetings and some professional development. I mean, not every professional development, some things can certainly be done virtually. This, and, and again, this is not a substitute for sick leave. If you're sick, the time is for you to rest and not worry about us. I mean, don't worry about, we, we want, the sick time is there for the staff to get better. That's, don't, please don't. <laughs> we want you to take the time if you're ill to rest, recover, rejuvenate. And this is just, you know, something that we can offer for, a, you know, hopefully it's a long-term uh, benefit and, and the measures, the performance measures work well. Thank you, Ms. Ferrer. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Ferrer. I appreciate you presenting that information. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> So I would like to make a motion for approval to adopt the Cartwright School District new policy, GBQ, Professional Support Staff Telecommuting, at the Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board meeting of January 13th, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. So again, we have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Vice President Lopez. Any discussion? <clears throat> All right, so we'll do our roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Vice President Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abathia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Abathia. And Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. I vote aye as well, and the motion carries unanimously. Yay. <clears throat> and now we're going to move on to item F, report summary of current events, and I give the floor to Dr. Aguilar Luller. Thank you. Um, thank you, board president, members of the governing board, uh, superintendent, uh, leadership team, 
audience, honors guests, and viewing public. Um, I would like to take a moment again to congratulate our governing board. It was very proud for those of us that were at the uh, ASA ASBA conference uh, to see the Cartwright School District Governing Board highlighted and honored. And because you're all here today, I would really love for you all to be in the picture. And so um, Alma and Veronica asked if they could take a picture with all of you um, for, um, for that. So if you don't mind, thank you. Please. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, as we continue um, to be short-staffed due to the Omicron cases, uh, we are managing in-person learning with our amazing Cartwright team. I just want to say thank you to all of you who have pitched in to cover classes, whether you're at the school site or at the district office. It's been quite amazing. Uh, we do have a lot of celebrations tonight. I'd like to congratulate Spitali Justine Spatani, STEAM Squared School and earning a PBIS Amazing Arizona Award. The purpose of the 2021 PBIS Amazing Award is to recognize schools for sustaining the implementation of a school-wide PBIS by focusing effort on strengthening Tier 1 with a focus on growing the green. And I just wanted to say that um, Spatani was one of just a few schools to get this honor. They'll get a poster to hang in their schools, digital badges, and additional signage for the school, and they'll be in a statewide publication and promotion of their achievement. Congratulations to Spatani and Principal Hecht. Thank you. Please make sure your uh, school under knows how proud we are of all of, all of them. Um, also, kudos to our very own uh, Krista Schweiger, our TOSA for EL and immigrant families. She was selected and, as you know, represents Cartwright to present at the ADEESSA conference this past Tuesday. Uh, Krista, we are so proud of you and all you do for our international newcomers. So congratulations, Krista. And um, I'd like to also offer a huge congratulations to Veronica Sanchez and her team in public relations, Alma. Um, I'm excited to share that the Cartwright School District website, the new one, won an award of excellence from the Arizona School Public Relations Association. We were the only district to garner an excellence award in the entire state of Arizona for its website. Um, thank you to Brock Higley, who came in just a month before the di district's website launch. With little experience, he managed to grab the top prize with serious competitors in the categories. We're talking about big guns like unified school districts uh, with staffing that have quadruple our size. Um, the public relations department, um, we are so proud of you. Also, uh, 3TV producer Christine Harrington also won the news reporter category for the Empty Seats Open Heart documentary at Spitalny. And um, obviously Spitalny and the star of the show sitting back there and Veronica and her team um, were huge. And so we're so excited and um, these will all be recognized um, soon as well. Um, the Public Relations Department also won two other awards of merit for multicultural outreach, social media, our Hispanic Heritage Campaign, and our overall enrollment campaign. Details of the award ceremony will be shared with the board and everyone soon. Again, congratulations to Harley, Brock, Alma, and Veronica. Congratulations.
The other thing that we're going to be doing tonight is um, a team from our district uh, went to California to visit the Twin Rivers School District. And so now at this time, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Juan Medrano come up to present about the trip and our vision to purchase electric vehicles. Dr. Medrano. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, executive team members, special guests, and audience members in attendance, as well as through YouTube. Um, yes, we are very grateful um, to have had the opportunity on December the 3rd to visit the Twin Rivers uh, Unified School District, which is located in um, northern Sacramento, California. And just a little bit of background, um, we do have some history um, from our um, prior relationship with uh, Chiefs by Arizona in December of 2019. Um, they were very generous in sponsoring um, several of our district leadership with our governing uh, board's support and approval to be able to visit uh, Twin Rivers at that time just to kind of go through. Twin Rivers um, has been one of the leading um, school districts across the nation in the state of California and being able to secure a large percentage of their bus fleet being um, transitioning to electric buses. Um, they have a lot of state support in those efforts in California and their air quality departments being able to chip in with that. And so um, at that time, they were able to give a lot of, uh, le a lot of tips and lessons for being able to um, guide Cartwright and the purchase and launch of our, our first electric bus in July of 2019. So um, we're very grateful to Chispa and appreciative of their continued sponsorship because they also made possible our most recent uh, visit back to uh, Twin Rivers to, to learn even more as we prepare to expand our electric bus fleet even further. So just a little bit of background about the Twin Rivers School District. So they are, they're geographically very large. Uh, they cover about 50 square miles in radius, consisting of urban, suburban, uh, rural uh, regions within their district. They have an enrollment of about 27,000 students, uh, recently consolidated. It was four, four uh, smaller districts at one time, and in the past couple of years, they had consolidated into, uh, into one uh, unified school district. And as of our visit, they now have uh, 43 electric school buses and had communicated with us. Their transportation director had communicated they have five on order that are, coming out, that are gonna be coming aboard this year and have plans to acquire another 20 in the next year or two. And um, we learned a ton on the visit. Uh, Ms. Howdigy, myself, uh, and our, our transportation director, uh, Alex Mata. And we have a short uh, video here that we'd like to show because I feel like it really it ca it gives a good snapshot of what that um, electric bus experience is like from the standpoint of, of scholars and staff members, drivers, and administrators. What seems to be a typical start of the school day procedure isn't typical at all in the Twin River School District in North Sacramento. Just listen. That's the sound of an electric bus that rides so quietly, those three tones were added so people nearby would know a very large vehicle was approaching. I drove this in San Francisco. And driving through San Francisco, people were very distracted. And I had a couple people almost walk right out in front of me, but the reason they didn't is because they heard that sound. And they looked up like, what was that? <laughs> Twin Rivers is the 27th largest school district in the state. But thanks to generous grants from energy commissions and air pollution control agencies, the district is on pace to have more than 40 electric buses in its fleet. That's more than any other district in the country. So by the year 2021, we should be um, diesel-free, 100% alternative fuel. It's clean air for kids and clean air for the communities. Electric buses are quieter because they're not burning diesel for energy. If you don't remember that old-fashioned school bus sound, here it is. Running on electricity also means the bus isn't creating exhaust to be breathed in by students, drivers, and mechanics. There are carcinogens in, in diesel exhaust, 
uh, the impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it, it makes sense from just, you know, personal health and the health of the planet. Nate Baggio is vice president of sales for Lion Electric, the leading manufacturer of electric buses. Lion has opened a bus experience center in Sacramento so other school districts can drop in to learn how they work and to determine if they're worth the investment. Up front, electric buses cost two and a half times a traditional diesel bus, but Lion Electric and Twin Rivers say these vehicles eventually pencil out. When you look at 80% less maintenance, 72% less uh, in fuel costs, uh, there's an economic argument. Maintenance costs are, are tremendous on older buses and breakdowns and kids getting to school late. So with the electric bus, we're, with the grant money, we're paying about $55,000 a bus. So that's how we can justify it. The return on investment is huge. The buses are charged when not in use. A bright panel reminds the driver how much battery power and how many miles remain before needing another charge. The range for these buses is 100 miles. Driver Paul Harrison was on board with the new buses pretty quickly. I was kind of a skeptic in the beginning. And once I got behind the wheel and started driving a bus, I say, wow, this is really, really nice. Kids say they enjoy the quieter ride. It's very comfortable, and we play music on the bus sometimes, and it gets very exciting. And it turns out those three tones are pretty memorable. Da -na -na. Me and my granny and my mom says that sounds like Christmas music. Now you'd think drivers especially would be sick of those tones that ring when the bus is traveling below 15 miles per hour. Nancy, our guide this day, surprised us. Her ringtone shows just how excited she is driving a bus that's saving energy and cutting emissions. The school bus industry has not done anything to innovate or change in the last 25 years. And here we get to innovate a little bit, and that's exciting, and I enjoy it. I am absolutely thrilled to be a part of it. School buses are increasingly going high-tech across the... All right, thank you, Mike. Yes, and the, and the ride was very quiet. Um, we did have an opportunity on the day that the um, tour was arranged, and again, Chispa just did an amazing job of coordinating with Twin Rivers and having a very structured and educational experience for all of us, but we did get to take a, a ride in the bus, and it is as quiet as described. You guys have been on it as well. It's a very, a very quiet ride and um, very nice. So um, some of the main lessons that we also picked up from getting the chance to talk to uh, Mr. Shannon, who was in the video, um, his uh, transportation director, Raymond Manila, uh, Manilo, and also Nancy was one of the drivers that joined us, was um, the importance of infrastructure and just being very um, carefully planned. And the word that Mr. Shannon used was future-proofing your infrastructure. So making sure you're looking down the road, knowing what funding is available uh, from your um, air quality departments, from your state, your local fund, your local funds possibilities, as well as your national and state grant opportunities. and and uh, making decisions on how many, up to how many buses do we want to be able to have in place by what time, and making sure that when we plan out that infrastructure, the transformers that need to go in, any, any of the uh, service entrance stations, all the electrical stuff, and chart number of chargers that were very, uh, very carefully planned out when it comes to that. And when we got there on our visit, their um, facility was actually under construction because they were installing another 83 um, charging stations and infrastructure to get ready for the new deployment that we talked about at the beginning uh, of bringing in new, uh, new buses. Um, they shared a little bit about the types of charging. Um, they're distinguished between dumb, dumb charging and smart charging. So um, dumb charging, kind of the more technical term of that is the plain one-way charging. So you have a charger that is available, typically a, a level two that takes a little longer to fully charge a bus and that doesn't take into account, you basically just plug in. You're not strategically saying, okay, we want it to charge during these hours because we could take advantage of the lower, util of the lower utility costs during that time. The smart chargers, it does the opposite. That is where you do make arrangements and this through, through technical solutions, through technology solutions, 
of um, programming your bus to charge when you can take advantage of those lower utility rate times. And kind of the, the, um, the best version of the smart charging is the what's called V to G, so vehicle to grid technology. That's basically where you can turn your bus fleet, depending on how many electric buses you have, into like a mini power plant. And it can store, um, it can store uh, charge and actually put it back into, back into the grid, which you can use to make some revenue off of. Um, some other benefits of transitioning to electric buses, um, you heard in the video, um, it's a, it's, there's cleaner air in and out of the bus. Um, some of the staff that, that spoke to our group had really talked about, in particular during the pandemic, when they had to, like, like many of us, go into distance learning, they were still utilizing their transportation as our, as, um, our food services and transportation did to provide meals out in the community but they designated specifically their electric buses to deliver that service in their community. So they weren't running any diesel on the facility at that time. And several of the people that were talking to us mentioned how there was a visible, uh, they visibly noticed there was not that fog of greenhouse gas that kind of hovered around the ground um, during that time. They didn't have the diesel smell and it was just a better overall experience. They felt healthier, the, didn't know what they didn't know at the time. Like, wow, this, this is what it's like to breathe clean air. Um, also, the, the savings and maintenance cost up to 80%. Um, the upfront two and a half times more expensive cost of the electric bus, typically by year seven or eight, and a 12 to 16 year life of a bus kind of pays off at that point, and then you start, you start on recuperating savings after that point based off of the uh, maintenance and savings costs. And then where we are right now, and also looking ahead, um, we do have, we have completed an infrastructure assessment just to kind of know what would we need on our current annex property to be able to support um, more buses coming in. And then also taking a look at, um, you know, what is the anticipated percentage that the federal, that we're anticipating the federal government is going to be putting into um, diesel emission reduction act grants. Um, the, the recent infrastructure um, law that was just passed in, in December, we know that $5 billion is coming nationally, 2.5 of that is for zero emissions buses, which would be the electric and another 2.5 for um, basically reduced emissions buses, so propane, natural gas. So we're just, we're still waiting to see what that materializes into, into opportunities. So we are in communication with the um, National Environmental Protection Agency and have been bugging them about when do you anticipate the um, national DARA grant opportunities are gonna become available. Uh, what was community, what's, what they replied is that we're probably looking at early summer for that because they're still trying to figure out um, what the specific um, distribution of the allocation is going to look like. And then state DARA grants, which is how we purchased, uh, which is a big part of how we purchased our first bus, um, that um, those grant opportunities is going to be coming open in February. So we're just, we're gearing up, um, re still reaching out to Twin Rivers to ask them for samples of, of their uh, successful grants and, and our procurement processes that they use for infrastructure and, and just to make sure that we're, we're geared up and, and ready to write successful grants to, to meet our goals. Um, so with that, I'll just, I'll leave it open to any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Dr. Medrano. Any questions from the board? Ms. Hernandez? Thank you, uh, Madam President, fellow board members, Dr. Lawler, executive team and those watching. Um, how comparable were the streets uh, in Twin Rivers to our pothole build of you know, Maryville? Can, can the suspension sustain in those electric buses withstand the uh, trauma that our front axles, which I just had an issue with? Uh. Oh, thank you for the question, Ms. Hernandez. Um, it was the, the small sampling of Sacramento that we got to see, it was, it was pretty comparable, it was diverse. Uh, we stayed in the downtown area, which was kind of similar to ours. And then when we drove out to um, the transportation facility, we got more into a little bit more of kind of a rural area, more narrow streets, just one, uh, one lane going each way, tighter squeeze. Um, with the suspension that you mentioned, one of, one of the advantages of the electric bus that um, the team talked about over there is that the, uh, the battery that powers it, that weight is distributed more evenly throughout the body of the bus. It's not front loaded or back loaded. And also um, the, regener the regenerative braking training that they give, um, basically how to, how to utilize the leverage of the bus itself in braking, that that also helps to preserve the life even of your, of your tires. You're not having to switch those out 
every 12 to 15,000 miles. I think they mentioned they were on, on some other buses they were over 50 and that the tread was still good, but you have to do the braking correctly. And then this, again, the design, the way that the battery system is, the weight is distributed, that that has some advantages to kind of guard against that and make the maintenance um, less costly. So, um, board president, uh, members of the executive leadership, members of the board, um, board member uh, Lydia Hernandez, one of the discussions we've been having is if we, with the forward thinking, uh, Dr. Madrano, if you want to speak to the fact that in the beginning it is more money, however, by year seven, um, you want to speak to how thinking forward and spending the money now in the long run will really help us um, with our financial situation. Um, yes, absolutely, Dr. Lawler. So um, yes, with the upfront cost, um, the electric buses are substantially more than what a, than what a diesel will run. So we're gonna, have, we're gonna be relying heavily, just like, um, just like our district did with the first electric bus, we're gonna rely very heavily on um, pursuing grants and attaining a majority of the funding through grants. Uh, we are looking right now, um, trying to see what the federal government's going to come back as to whether they would cover 50% of the upfront cost or po poten there's potential for up to 85%. We don't know where it's going to fall within that range, but then that's going to let us know what we have to come up with uh, locally to be able to, to make up the difference. Um, but again, one of the things when they talked about maintenance, uh, the, ma the maintenance cost, is that over, by the time you get up to a, the, a, an electric bus typically has a 12 to 15 year life. And so by year seven, um, you know, you're not, you're not doing transmission changes, oil changes, all the, uh, everything that comes with servicing a, a diesel bus isn't in place anymore. You're not having to keep as large of an inventory. So um, in the readings that CHISPA provided to us and in, in the information that the team at Twin Rivers gave to us, they had said by year seven is about the time that you have, like uh, the gentleman mentioned here, that things start to pencil out because your, your, your maintenance costs have, have significantly reduced by, up to, by upwards around 80%. So once you reach that year seven point, you're breaking even and then going, in, going beyond that for the next five to eight years of the life of the bus, you're actually are able to recoup those, recoup those savings and, and utilize it for other um, important operations within within a school district. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team, and those in the audience. Thank you, Dr. Medrano, for the presentation. I uh, had an opportunity to tour the um, transportation shop here at our district of district building, the annex, and as I was lost looking for my uh, testing um, I, I got a chance to see the the shop and and definitely I, I think I would encourage you know my fellow board members once we get to that time of making a decision to find the time for us to go on a field trip to that um, shop department uh, again I do hold a uh, commercial license and I was fascinated by seeing the um, all the equipment that we have, all the barrels of oil uh, and fluids uh, that we have, um, it, it just takes all of them. I asked um, our Director of Transportation, uh, Mr. Mata, about who's responsible for keeping up with maintenance and, and keeping up to code whenever DPS comes and, and does their, um, their checkup on the building. And so really with the electric bus is the, the only fluid that you have on that on that bus is your um, windshield fluid that's 
that's about it. There's there's no diesel, no oil. Uh, definitely, I think it's it's worth the the investment once we get to that point. And last year, when I attended the CAPC conference in California, uh, Lion Electric was also there showcasing their bus. And I'm glad that you guys had a chance to see the the Lion buses. Um, definitely, they, they manufactured their own bus, uh, top to bottom. I know uh, some of the other manufacturing companies, um, they retrofit their buses, so they put it together from different either busing companies or, or just they built something, you know, like a Lego, I guess, for lack of a better word. And, you know, from what I saw from Lion is, you know, they manufacture everything, they put it together, they take care of the bus, you know, with service agreements with the district. So I think once we get to the point, you know, that could be a good good partner to look into um, for our district as we hope to transition to this um, electric fleet down the line. I know it's definitely way, way long term, uh, but if we can start setting the vision uh, and infrastructure little by little, we can probably get there. You know, in the next 10 years, 20 years, you know, maybe we can have a full electric fleet. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Lopez and Ms. Hernandez. Um, any other questions? Go ahead, Ms. Abethia. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members, executive team, those in attendance. Um, thank you, Dr. Madrano, for the presentation. Um, I really enjoyed the video. Um, just to go back on the question that um, board member um, Lydia Hernandez um, asked about the uh, the cost and the, the seven years and um, the plan for that. Um, just to clarify, or maybe you would have um, a better understanding on what like the price kind of looks like for the district, but would you say that it's it costs us more like Right now, buying a diesel, it's pro it's cheaper than buying a electric school bus, correct? But down the road, with the costs of all of the diesels, it's going to cost us more to maintain those diesels than in those seven years, right? Than than electric school bus. Yes, that is correct. And then I think um, related to that, one other important um, piece that I forgot to mention is. Um, with diesel, another long-term consideration to keep in mind are the, the health impacts. So one of the drivers that was in our uh, speaking to our group had talked about just so many of the um, respiratory issues that a, that a lot of um, a lot of their colleagues have, you know, from having been in um, in the business for a lot of years and and you know, constantly um, inhaling inhaling diesel fumes. And um, that's that's one of the, the long-term issues is keeping in mind um, how the greenhouse gas emissions, the the uh, emissions from from diesel fuel, that especially in younger younger children who's uh, who are still developing their respiratory system, how that's a, one one of the contributing factors to asthma conditions and um, like the gentle, one of the gentlemen in the video had mentioned how this you know the carcinogens within within those uh, those fumes so. So on the on the economic side, yes, there is the, there's the maintenance and fuel costs are, are substantial, and, you know, and we can recoup those halfway, a little over halfway through the life of the diesel. But at then also, also keeping in mind the um, the health benefits, you know, of, of kids not um, not having to stand in line next to an idling diesel bus, or even when they're in the bus, you know, at the the greenhouse gases that are you know coming through coming through the bottom and. I asked that question because I actually just recently had a conversation with somebody about uh, just how much it really sucks to uh, maintain your car, just getting oil changes, uh, getting an alignment, your tires, just every day uh, maintaining your car and keeping it up up to what it needs to be um, uh, available to drive. And I kind of just wanted to 
repoint that out for our audience to kind of understand like that's just like our everyday cars and this is a bus so just kind of keeping that in mind that like it's it's pretty expensive i'm sure to get an oil change for a bus <laughs> rather than, than like a you know um a nissan or a toyota or something like that um but i just i kind of wanted I, I just wanted you to put it more out there um for our audience to kind of keep that in mind for the long term seven years um effect for us um financially so thank you oh, thank you it's a great point thank you mr Batia. Um, go ahead, Ms. Hernandez, and then Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Madam President, uh, fellow board members, executive team, Dr. Lawler, and those watching, and Dr. Medrano, and I'm sorry, I, I'm thinking here, and I'm listening to the conversation, and I just can't, it is a beautiful conversation, just because of my experience uh, in serving this long on this board. I think maybe, I'm glad it's being recorded, because I remember arguing this issue just for the sake. I, I think I was uh, threatened to get on seat. Isn't that when you came in, Mr. Lopez? <laughs> it was uh, a big controversial issue because we had an administration that did not want air-conditioned buses, and we are now discussing electric buses. What, 10 years ago? It's a great conversation. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad I had to share that, but and also along with that, and the reason I ask these questions in terms of funding and, and the projection uh, and the feasibility because of what we're going through and, and the projection, I'm gonna go back to the project, those projections, is that in the past, I'm just wary when we get into contracts in a relationship with a, a business partner, I think I'm gonna say we had a uh, million, a million dollars was a long, I mean, I think our budget was like twice what it may be more than it is now. And we had a, um, it had to do with the electric use. Now we've got the solar panel, right? But again, a long way in that conversation. But we adopted and we voted and we passed and it was urgent and we had to get it done. And we passed um, um, a contract for, I don't know, over a million dollars. And along with the, the, it came, the proposal came with the hiring of a person that would help educate the district on how to conserve energy. And that involved just providing education to turn off the light switch, what, you know, those hours. Um, we just never got to, we just never got to, I kept asking year after year where the savings or the, those cost savings happened. So I'm just worried. And um, not that I don't want those electric buses. And I can see the, uh, the impact, especially with, you know, the, uh, the climate change and everything. But it's, that's where I'm coming from. When, Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, President Hernandez will be right back. Uh, and I did have a question. Well, not a question, but a comment, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members, executive team. The um, one, one thing to keep in mind as well is that we're not just paying for diesel, for the diesel buses. Diesel buses or, or trucks, semi-trucks, they also consume uh, what is called DEF or DEF, which is the diesel exhaust fuel system. Again, you know, we're purchasing this uh, on top of the diesel to, you know, meet standards, um, air quality standards. And so again, you know, down the line, once we get to this point, it's gonna be crucial that we take at every, that we look at all the expenses and really pencil it out to see how much of an investment a return for the investment we'll get for the electric buses. So I just wanted to put it out there. I, I know that if you don't drive a diesel, you probably don't know what, you know, we just talked about, but it's, it's more than just diesel. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions since I am taking ownership of this meeting for the time being? <laughs> no questions? No questions. Um, Comments? Board Member Hernandez. Um, the one we purchased was, I want to say about, is over 400, about 450, or over 450.
Yeah, it was the uh, Volkswagen settlement and the ADQ and Maricopa County and many other institutions uh, pitched in or supported the, the buying of the vehicle. So we didn't spend for safety from us. And the state grant as well, and I was a part of that. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Oh, hearing none, thank you, Dr. Medrano. All right, thank you. Now, uh, moving on to item G, which is consent agenda, Dr. Lawler. Um, thank you, uh, Vice President Lopez, members of the governing board, executive leadership team, audience, honored guests, and those watching um, via YouTube. The administration recommends approval of the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Lawler. Do we have consent to approve the agenda as presented? Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I second. Uh, we have a motion by Vice President Garcia. Do we? <laughs> Board Member Garcia, sorry, it's just. Um, do we have a second? Second by uh, Board Member Lita Hernandez. Any discussion? Sharon, none. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Um, board member Lita Hernandez, how do you vote? I'm sorry, I thought I had a note regarding one of your items, but. We can come back if, yes. if you want. Um, board member Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. Board member Avetia, how do you vote? I vote aye. President Hernandez, how do you vote? I vote aye as well, thank you. And I vote aye as well. Um, board member Lita Hernandez. Um, Board Member Hernandez votes aye. Uh, we have a unanimous consent for the approval of the agenda as presented. And I vote aye as well. Um, back to you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Go right ahead. Um, President um, Hernandez, Vice President Lopez, members of the board, executive leadership team, and honored guests, I just would like to say congratulations Welcome back to the assistant principalship, Mr. D Jason Warner, who um, will now be the assistant principal of Mark T. Atkinson Middle School and Gifted Academy. There he is, so welcome back. He's very excited, so congratulations, Jason. He's already started, so um, he's already ready to go, <laughs> so thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I just wanna go back one second because I took too long and say thank you to Dr. Medrano and Director Mata for the continued, and our leadership and administration of course, the cabinet, for continuing the partnership with CHISPA and the continued advocacy for the clean air, clean climate and clean community in Maryville and also to Twin River School District and all of you for going out there to find um, not only out more about their Electra School Bus program, but also um, being able to gain the knowledge on their funding and how they gain grants to be able to make those purchases as well. So I wanted to say thank you for that. <clears throat> and then moving on to now, item H, which is our other information and discussion items and representatives, just remember if you would like to say anything, just kind of wave at me so that I can know. Our first item is number one, COVID-19 mitigation and metrics update by Dr. Medrano. Madam President, members of the board, uh, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, executive team members, special guests, and audience uh, members in attendance and through YouTube. Um, this week's uh, update for COVID metrics, it's, it's been a, a busy time since we've been back and a lot of um, really selfless work. We know across all of our schools with uh, teachers, our ESPs, our administrators, um, district office staff, 
just pulling together to make sure that um you know we're keeping keeping things afloat so that our, our students can keep attending um, in person school which which is so important but um the numbers that you're going to hear this evening w will be um, reflective of the experience that we've been having I um, just want to thank all of our nurses our, our um, COVID technician Alexis at, um, uh, Mr. Stevenson for all they've been doing with uh, you know assisting with rapid testing and, and helping us uh, keep our keep our campuses safe but for um, this week's um, metrics we have seen some pretty dramatic increases both in terms of um, cases per 100,000 people and also percent positivity with numbers uh, recently updated today from Maricopa County so in terms of cases per 100,000 people um, the last uh, measurement that was reported um, that was reported to our governing board was 244.44 cases per 100,000 people uh, the, the most recent one as of today is 1527.15 cases per 100,000 people and the percent positivity rates have increased from the last time we reported in uh, mid-December from 23.02 percent positivity to now 42.66 uh, percent positivity in terms of vaccination uptake within our community um, we are seeing a little a little bit more um, a, a little bit more um, elevated uh, significant increases so overall in the zip code of 85031 the last time we had reported the, the percentage of, of people with at least one in their series of vaccinations was 40.3 percent as of today it's at 53 percent in the same zip code um, in 85033 our last reporting it was 48.1 percent as of today it's 51.6 percent and in 85035 uh, last reporting it was at 48.2 percent and it is as of today 51.9 percent um, for our young children in our community ages 0 to 14 years of age um, our children age 5 and up are eligible to receive vaccinations and um, we've also seen uh, an expansion of the opportunity to get a booster for anybody that is 12 and up now and the the window of time to go and get your booster if for uh, fi the window of time for Pfizer and Moderna has decreased from having to wait six months out to now five months um, but our vaccination uptake percentages for uh, within our community for children ages 0 to 14 in 85031 as of our last reporting in mid-December it was at 9.54 percent today it's at 15.06 percent um, in 85 zip code 85033 at last reporting it was at 9.03 percent and as of today it's at 13.82 percent and in zip code 85035 at last reporting it was at 8.6 percent as of today it's at 13.6 percent um, what we're continuing to do to make sure that we're mitigating as much as possible is um, we're, we continue to carefully monitor CDC guidance um, so we learned that over uh, so universal masking is still a requirement um, that's something that we're that we're carefully enforcing um, careful sanitization of all of our of all of our schools on a daily basis our buses um, doing the deep cleanings on Fridays to make sure all surfaces and, and buses are, are, are clean thoroughly to keep everybody safe um, we've also gotten um, for our um, after-school activities for right now they're on a, on a, on a temporary pause you know just in the understanding um, you know as Dr. Lawler had communicated to all of us in the understanding of what everybody's been doing to pull together to keep um, in-person schooling going but also for the safety of our of our scholars the numbers that you heard you know we have to we have to proceed very carefully and keep a, a very close eye on um, how those metrics are trending and we are also um, following recent CDC guidance for isolation and quarantine um, that came that changed um, in late December that now um, regardless of vaccination status individuals that test positive um, will have to have to isolate for five days if symptoms if symptoms improve or if an individual is asymptomatic 
at that point and they're not running a fever, they can return on day six but have to mask indoors and outdoors as much as possible as soon as they return to school. So that's just a way of balancing safety with also trying to balance um, keeping um, structures in place so that our scholars are, are able to continue with in-person school. Um, for and, uh, exposures, there was also recent um, updated guidance. Anybody that's exposed to somebody that tested positive for COVID-19, um, that does depend on your vaccination status. So if you are vaccinated or it's been longer than six months since your initial series of Pfizer or Moderna, or it's been longer than two months since your first seat, since your um, um, Johnson & Johnson vaccination, if you are exposed to somebody who's positive, you will have to quarantine for five days. And if symptoms improve or you're asymptomatic and no fever at the, at the fifth day on day six, you can come back. But again, we'll have to mask for the next five days um, with exposures. If you're fully vaccinated, that being defined as I've gotten my, my series with the, uh, Pfizer and Moderna in the last six months or my Johnson & Johnson in the last two months, if I've gone beyond that initial series timeline, I've gotten boosted, then I'm also considered fully vaccinated. Then I would not, if as long as I'm not having symptoms uh, or um, if I'm not having symptoms, I can continue to come to work or school, but do have to wear a mask at all times, indoors and outdoors for 10 days. So this is communication that we've sent out to all of our community, to our families over uh, as we were getting ready to return from winter break. And that's also been shared with all of our teachers, staff and administrators. Um, communication has been essential during this time as part of our mitigation as well, as we've had to you know, make sure that we're providing support and coverage across schools. Our, uh, our COVID technician has been, has been um, kicking into that support a lot and helping out at our different schools. So just communicating um, where we're gonna be providing rapid testing, because there's been a lot of requests and demand for that as our numbers would suggest. And then also just communicating um, you know, be, being also honest about where we stand in terms of, uh, with the high demand, where we stand in terms of supply from rapid tests that we're getting from Maricopa. It's, it's limited, they're doing their best to keep up, but it's limited. And so, you know, we're just continuing to be honest in our communication that we really have to prioritize individuals who are symptomatic, if at all possible, because we have to be able to preserve our supply in uh, making sure that we're providing testing for those that are gonna need it most and just being available available to our teachers, staff, and administrators to answer questions, to help them think through um, different scenarios that come up because so many of them are so unique. And we wanna make sure that we're giving precise and accurate guidance that is, uh, that's governed by, by CDC guidance so that we're, being, we're, we're giving sound um, guidance that's gonna keep people safe. Um, President Hernandez, members of the governing board, um, audience, and executive leadership team, those watching on YouTube. Um, item number 19, um, thank you governing board for approving our consent agenda. Uh, does speak to the mitigation um, that we're continuing um, to stay on top of. Uh, yesterday, um, Ms. Farrar and I went to the um, ASBO, the Arizona Association of School Business Officials, and we had um, heard from the Arizona Department of Health. And they're very optimistic about the, um, this Omicron um, because if you are fully vaccinated, and that includes your booster, um, you're, you may have the, um, you might get the um, COVID-19, but you won't even know it, or your symptoms are so mild, just as Dr. Medrano talked about. And if we can get everybody who is eligible to get their booster um, as far as staffing goes within the next, because they're saying that this should end if we all do our part by mid-February, <laughs> then we're all stretched so thin that um, we are offering a, an incentive, a booster incentive. Uh, and I will ask um, Veronica and her department to send that out to all staff. The timeline is very quick because we want everyone boosted and in classrooms. The other great news is they're recommending that uh, school districts go back to their governing boards and ask for an indoor mask mandate. Our governing board has already done that, which is exciting. The other thing that they um, shared with us, the science shows uh, very clearly that the um, air filtration systems that we've put into every campus and every building, 
works extremely well and knock on wood, that's probably one of the biggest reasons we've been able to keep in-person school. The masking and the actual air filtration sh systems, they say work really hard and I didn't want to take it for granted, but many of the school districts around us don't have those HVAC systems put in and they're recommending that we buy the two of those for every classroom. Well, we don't have to do that because we used our solar panel savings, energy savings to be able to do that for every school district, as soon as, as school classroom, as soon as the coronavirus started and got that done very quickly. So that has really helped with the in-person and I'm not sure if I forgot anything else, um, for, uh, Victoria, but. So anyways, everyone's doing a great job. Um, I'll have um, Veronica and her team send out the um, opportunity. Obviously it's not a mandate, but the more that we can get fully vaccinated, the better it is for you, your families, and our scholars, and we can put this virus behind us. That's the goal, right? <laughs> so thank you. And then if I may add real quick, I'm just in line with that, uh, with the um, incentive that's been approved this evening, and thank you for that. Um, we are going to we are bringing opportunities um, within our district beginning next week. Um, that was one of the other items approved tonight. So thank you for that. We're going to start offering uh, weekly testing at two of our schools. The first one being next Friday at uh, Cartwright from noon to seven, and then uh, that'll be a, a weekly event through uh, in partnership with Maricopa County and Albertsons. And then we are um, working on establishing a start date for. Um, doing this on Wednesdays at Atkinson from 4 to 7 p.m. As of right now, it's scheduled for the tw uh, J January 26th, and we are picking up um, the, some of the vaccination events that Phoenix Union had been doing over at Maryvale. So um, we're, we're chipping in to do our part with that campaign. And we'll bring, be bringing some more opportunities to our governing board on the uh, January 27th board meeting so that we have, so that we have real good regional coverage for opportunities for uh, getting either your uh, first series of vaccinations or your booster. Well, wait a minute, can you rewind that last part? We do have information for the boosters. Just that last sentence about the boosters and the vaccines. Yes, yeah, so the vaccination events, they do offer the uh, initial series as well as boosters. At, the, at Phoenix Unions? At their events, okay. yes. Because it's been kind of difficult to get a booster shot scheduled um, but that part I didn't know I didn't see that in the message that they sent so that was that's good information to have along with all the rest of it of course um, sorry fellow board members Dr. Aguilar Lawler everyone in attendance and viewing on zoom and our cabinet um, just really quick <clears throat> everybody's experiencing the increase in COVID it's been terrible and you can tell based on how long it takes to find a test. And the lines by the YMCA and at Maryville and the different campuses when they're now stretched, you know, back to the beginning, you know, back in the beginning of the pandemic, how long they were then, if not longer. Um, so it's great to see that we're continuing our partnership and making it easier for people to get their vaccines, their boosters, the retesting and the notifications um, that are sent out about COVID to the, through our students as well. <clears throat> I mean, in one class, there's two notifications in one week. And then of course, with our staff shortages and it's definitely been difficult. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Medrano for taking such care with the presentation and the information that's provided. Um, and I'm sorry, because I know you guys had questions. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team. Thank you, Dr. Medrano, for the information. The um, the upcoming testing, the weekly testing, that is open to the community, correct? Not just students and staff? Uh, yes, Mr. Lopez, it's open to the community. Would it be possible that we can get an email with those um, details, like the location and the hours, so that we can you know, pass it out to folks that you know ask about it? Yes, absolutely. That's going out to all staff uh, tomorrow, and I'll provide that as Perfect. well for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Medrano. I think you can text 67587 to get their messages, but yes, if you would share it, that would be awesome. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Dr. Medrano. Yes. <laughs> 
So our, our next item is item two, the first reading for discussion and information regarding current Cartwright School District proposed revised policy exhibit KF-EC, community use of school facilities, school facilities, user fees. Dr. Medrano. Yeah, so for this first reading, um, we are requesting a, an increase in the um, uh, facilities uh, use uh, rates that we charge for custodial services. Um, there's two parts within policy that are mentioned as far as the, the rate that's charged. One is for um, when uh, a facility use goes beyond the hours that um, custodians normally work, so going into overtime. And then the other is if the event is during the day or during regular hours but requires a substantial effort from the site. And the principal has the uh, discretion to, um, to be able to charge up to a certain amount, to, in, in, um, basically because having to pull the individual from other duties. And so the current rates that were um, listed, we try and cover those, fee cover those uh, facility use fees through um, the reason of the, the uh, fees that we charge for um, for providing services to the event. Um, but for beyond overtime hours, the amount that had been listed of 25 per hour, that doesn't fully cover the uh, the rate that we would have to pay a custodian that stays to clean, to provide custodial services for uh, a practice that might go until nine o'clock or 9.15 so, and wanting to make sure that the next day, the campus, that, that 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 space is, is all ready to go, a trash has been thrown, sanitized. And then the, uh, the so we're looking to increase that rate to, uh, I believe it was the 4167. And then the uh, for the um, principal discretion to be able to charge um, during, during the day event, that is um, also just keeping in mind lo and looking at the, um, the pay rates for our custodians, being able to cover, um, to cover the hourly rate for a person on the highest level of um, of the of those pay rates that are providing that uh, service. Thank you, Dr. Madrano. <clears throat> and so, just for clarification for the board, the only changes to the policy are the price, the cost. Um, so the per hour for the custodian outside of normal custodian hours is 4067 up from 25 and the during custo regular hours is increasing to 2711 from $25 there are no other changes to the policy <clears throat> yes that's correct it would only be the uh, the, the rate that we charge thank you dr madrano any questions or comments or discussion from the board? Ms. Abetia? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, fellow board members, Dr. Lawler, uh, executive team, and those here in attendance. Um, I'm just curious, I've, I've never, I didn't really know we did this. This is really cool. Um, <laughs> so um, I actually coach cheerleading um, with an outside program that's a feeder program into Central High School. And I'm just curious because I, um, with like the, the the names here, like um, like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, is it only limited to these organizations, or is it available for other organizations that would that would need um, a facility to practice on and willing to pay? Um, it's available to um, many different types of organizations. Those that are um, most in alignment with our educational mission is where we can make the consideration to not charge the reasonable use fee. Got it. The, the okay. custodian fee is, is something a little different because that's where, you know, we want to make sure that the whatever space is used, that, it's, that the campus is ready for the next day. Got it. Okay, well, then I potentially have some business for us. So <laughs> just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez? Thank you, uh, Madam President, uh, Dr. Lawler, fellow board members, uh, executive team, and those uh, watching us on YouTube. Uh, this is, um, I understand um, the rationale behind the increase, and it's needed just like everything else. I just want to uh, share yet another experience of a previous um, uh, administration. One of the, another main issue along with the, 
the air conditioned buses were was the no use of facilities for our soccer leagues that were um, recruiting our our own children to work and you know to um, to play soccer. Um, there's many huge conglomerate sized you know uh, soccer leagues all over the valley. Um, I am concerned, you know, whether the, uh, whether these soccer leagues will continue. They, uh, the kids contribute, I think, like a very minimal uh, amount for membership, and that's how they survive and they pay their coach and things like that. And I know they have to clean up and do other things. Since then, I haven't visited visited this, but uh, but understand the rationale behind it. I just wanted to voice uh, just a hesitancy uh, during during like now. Uh, and what's happening, I don't know, you know, the current activity levels with those soccer leagues because those are our own kids here in the West Side, just to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Dr. Madrano. Our next item is item three the EL Immigrant Families Update from Dr. Heather Cruz. Good evening, President Hernandez, uh, Governing Board members, Superintendent Aguilar Lawler, um, President, um, President Hernandez, uh, Cabinet, uh, members on YouTube, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm uh, really happy to present and give you an update on our immigrant um, refugee program. You heard a little bit about that earlier tonight from our superintendent. Um, our, super our superstar, Krista Schweiger, um, but she just continues to be a marvel for us. Um, so you saw probably on our consent agenda, uh, first of all, we have a new job that will be posted after tonight, so that was at part of the urging of you in the fall when she gave her presentation. Um, so that will be posted after this evening and we'll begin recruiting for that after, after this evening. Um, we've been training our office managers on how to use uh, language lines. We've um, incorporated that into this. We also have language line coming on which will help translate some of our documentation that we need some of our written documentation, which is really helpful for some of those um, documents, such as our COVID forms, et cetera. Um, um, we also um, have you heard Dr. Aguilar Lawler talk about how Krista has presented at some of our statewide conferences um, just lately, the uh, ADE conference, the HOPE conference, and also the ESSA conference. So, and she was also featured by ASBA and their, their news, I don't know if you get that in your email feed on the AZ News, and um, Veronica shares that, such a nice article about our program. Um, she's getting such nice exposure that other districts are reaching out to her to help them start their program and to help them um, learn how to support their scholars that are coming into their program. So um, word is spreading about, <laughs> about our, our wonderful Krista. So, um, that's, that's where we're at. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Any questions from the board? Comments? Uh, Madam President, members of the governing board, uh, executive leadership team, audience, and those um, watching on YouTube. Dr. Cruz, can you um, explain a little bit about the new position that our governing board just approved to support Krista? One of the reasons why we brought that forward was because um, of all of the governing board's requests that this could not be a one-man team. And so I wanted to call the attention and thank you as well for approving that tonight. Um, if you could share um, that as well, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, because, because there really is just Krista. Um, she will have um, a partner in crime, so to speak, uh, moving into next year that will help her um, uh, you know, help uh, move around the district and help her m more so with um, translation uh, that will be um, more fluent in some other languages, um, maybe help move some of our families um, 
maybe get them to where they need to be, et cetera, using our district vehicles, um, get them get them helping with their registration process, get them some of their documents that they need. Um, at, so uh, just all of the things that maybe just one person can't, can't do. So um, we are very, very thrilled to have that position. And Krista is over the moon, <laughs> I can tell you. So we are very thrilled that will be uh, posted tomorrow morning. So we're very excited. And we'll serve as a great support for the program. Um, and we, we get new scholars all the time. We um, got six new scholars from Af Afghanistan just this week. Go ahead, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar, Lawler, fellow board members, all those in attendance. That is wonderful, true to my heart, um, true to our hearts. Um, so question regarding the, the new, our newest additions. Would you happen to know just what those numbers look like? I know that's a tough one, and, and so we can always request that at a later time, but I'm so excited. And I think maybe I'll do that soon. I'm, I'd be Future. happy to provide that in a board report to you. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to do that. And the how, well, again, I'll wait until requested items come about. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd be happy to provide that. That's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm so excited for that needed position. And you're right. Uh, she's, Chris has been like the Lone Ranger. So let her know how grateful we are. I'd be happy Thank to you. do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Item number four is an update regarding governing board request for, presented by Dr. Aguilar Luller. Um, thank you, governing board president, members of the governing board, executive leadership team, audience, special guest, and those watching on YouTube. At a recent uh, governing board meeting, there was a request to have a presentation regarding our fundraising. And at this time, we are not going to be um, doing that presentation. So um, that is hopefully something we'll be able to do in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Luller. Coming up, Ms. Hargi. Um, item number five is an update, governing board request presented by Emma Howdigy. Good evening, Superintendent Aguilar Lawler, um, Madam President, governing board members, viewing audience, cabinet, and the principals. Uh, yes, we had a couple of requests. First one was from you, Ms. Hernandez, and that was the truancy in the community. So we are working with our um, truancy officer to create a PowerPoint. So we're hoping to have that ready for your viewing in February. So we will have a presentation at that time. We also were asked about our crisis protocol. So we are going to be sharing that in the board bulletin and then also create a PowerPoint just so that it's very clear when we present that. So we wanna share that in both ways. And then the last thing is Ms. Hernandez did ask, what were the child crises going on in our community in Arizona? So what we're thinking for that is we're gonna have one of our social workers speak to what they're seeing in our district. That way we kind of know what's happening here in the Cartwright School District. And so we're hoping to have those presentations in February. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Item number six is our meet and confer update presented by Joint committee here, Susan Doyle and Michella Stevens, our CEA president. Madam President, members of the governing board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, um, executive team and guests, I just wanted to give a brief update on our meet and confer process. Our last meeting was yesterday and Michelle Stevens and I are going to be requesting Barca loungers for next year's um, <laughs> meetings because we think we need those. Um, I just wanted to share that at this point, um, the board team and the CEA team have agreed upon eight items. 
Um, those are ranging from uh, things like eliminating early dismissal because of our four-day scholar week um, to things like the sick leave payout that we're recommending moving forward and a variety of other things. Um, we have also agreed on um, three memos of understanding, and I will let Ms. Stevens share those with you. Good evening, President Hernandez, Governing Board Team, uh, Dr. Lawler, and all the people. <laughs> um, memorandums of understanding, we agree to form a committee to review various stipends, to form a committee to create a riff rubric for non-teaching certified educators, and we agree that a designee of social emotional learning team will draft procedures for staff to create a conflict resolution procedure. And um, he's sharing the above as well. Sure. Um, and at the moment, we have not reached agreement on two items and um, are still a little bit in discussions through, um, we're communicating with one another um, on the last two um, proposals. Thank you. Do you have any questions yes. for us? <laughs> any questions? Seeing none. Thank you, ladies. Always a pleasure to see you two together working well. Thank you. So we will move on to item seven, which is our update on reorganizing schools due to enrollment for the 2022-2023 school year, presented by Dr. Aguilar Luller and Ms. Victoria Farrar. Uh, thank you, board president, members of the governing board, executive leadership team, cabinet, viewing audience, um, and thank you principals. I know I can see you fading over there and I really apologize, I know you're exhausted. We're getting there, we're getting there. Um, so as you know, we've embarked since um, school started past fall on this journey, a very difficult journey, um, looking at our current enrollment and looking how we can move forward and still thrive as a Cartwright school district that offers just everything possible to our scholars and our staff and our families. And through that, we've had to make, uh, we've asked several constituency groups from our um, CAT team, our Cartwright Associated team leaders, our ESP forums, our principal meetings. We've even had strategic planning with our governing board, um, our PAC meeting, we, we talked to our parents. And it's just been, um, like I said, a very difficult journey because nobody ever wants to cut and nobody wants to, to make changes. And we have a finite amount of money. And you know, I'm very excited that Governing Board um, uh, Bulletin is going to show. We just got the Auditor General report, and um, we are actually doing extremely well, um, thanks to um, all of you and Victoria and her team. Um, just understanding and, and how we have to move forward in very difficult times. And I know that um, part of that reorganization is looking at our special area teachers and how we staff, looking at how we staff our social emotional learning people at the schools, our ITRIBs, our psychologists, our IT departments, our, our, um, our ed services, uh, our district office business services, how we we, um, you know, our ESPs, transportation, we've looked at everything. And I don't think there's one department that's, um, you know, walking away without any kind of, of um, some kind of cut. But the one thing that we have committed to is, even though we're reorganizing and having to change things around, we don't want to lose any staff members. We are looking at um, how we can, review every per, every teacher's, um, you know, what is it that they can do? What are their top three? How can we help them cross train? And I know it's difficult. And you do not have to convince me about, um, you know, special areas. They're all important. PE is extremely important. My husband was a PE teacher before he became a firefighter. I absolutely understand the importance. And all the things that you talk about, for um, physical education and just in general being active and and that is extremely important and we always want to make sure that's going to be part of the scholar whether they have PE two days one day just that it's always part of the educational program with that said um, we have made some decisions about some not just with special areas but we wanted to also share 
tonight that we're reorganizing some of our attendance areas. And um, we've had to, um, we're gonna be making an announcement tomorrow um, um, with the, on the website and sending the postcard and following all the procedures that we need to. So we'll have public hearings at the end of the, the January meeting and then also the February meeting and so I'd like for Victoria to come forward and kind of share um, where these um, different uh, attendance area changes are going to be located. So Ms. Farrar. Good evening, Board President, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, members of the executive team, and everyone in attendance on YouTube. The uh, restructuring attendance areas, uh, there would be a restructuring for Atkinson Middle School it would stay in middle school with the IB and Gifted Academy, but the general education seventh and eighth graders would go to either Sands, Spitalny, or Castro. So that's you know one of the major changes. And there's a small portion of Pena that's actually in Davidson's quadrant that would go to Davidson. So there's just a little bit of cleanup. We think that was more of a busing issue, not really a formal attendance area change. So we, we, you know, we've gone through board docs to look, we don't actually see that that was an official change. So those are Davidson students, the department complex on the North East quadrant. Um, so the, the biggest changes would be the uh, seventh and eighth graders from Atkinson going to either San Spitalny or Castro. And then also, Ms. Farrar, if you would also, we're still open enrollment district, oh. and so we're still going to honor that. I know that um, everybody has their, um, you know, I was talking to Mr. Newman, and he's like, oh, I want those scholars to continue going to Pena. Those, that's, we're going to allow for all of that, but if they do want to not have to take a bus and walk to their home neighborhood school, they would have that option as well. And as, as Dr. Aguilar Lawler said, you know, we are an open enrollment state, so you can go from, you know, in district transfers, you know, Cartwright School to Harris School when you pretty much whenever you want to. So that's part of what we are, that what we do, that's part of statute. So we still always offer in district open enrollment. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> I just want to say, um, my daughter participates. You want to? You have a question? Okay, my daughter participates, and I'm grateful for the open enrollment because we have three schools at least near our house, but she chooses to go to Glenelg Downs. Um, so definitely helpful because it does provide our students with the opportunities to still go to the school of their choice, whether it be their home school or one that's a little bit further away. I mean, we've got a lot of great schools. Um, so thank you. Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, everyone in attendance. So my question would be or is, have you or have we received feedback from families and scholars regarding their wish list and or request to stay where they are? The policy that governs the notifications for any attendance area changes is a JC. So it would actually take a notice that would go out tomorrow. So there has been no official notice yet. That notice will go out to the students tomorrow. You also have to notify for statute the, the residents in the area, even if they don't have scholars. So that would be mailed out. So you do, do the notice, you have to have a minimum of 10 days before the next meeting, which would be January 27th. So you would have a public hearing at that point, and then it wouldn't be adopted if the board approved that it wouldn't happen until the February 10th meeting. So we're starting that process. So this is the very first notification anyone, you know, official notification anyone has had, but we still have, you know, statutory requirements as far as notification and public hearings so we can make the February board meeting. I appreciate that, especially because they have a choice and this is a, also would open the door for a great opportunity to select schools where they choose to attend, for example, the arts. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Ms. Farrar. Any other comments or questions? 
Awesome. Thank you very much. Our next item, <clears throat> excuse me, our next item is our board updates. This evening we're going to go a different route and <laughs> look at me like that. <laughs> we're gonna, are you prepared or no? All right, so we will start with Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, everyone in attendance. Uh, gee whiz, well, first of all, I apologize for being tardy. I just drove in from Tubac at a week-long training, which was very educational for me. And so what I would like to share as part of my update is what I learned, and that is gratitude. And I wrote a whole bunch of notes, but I'm only going to give a little bit of information. So beginning with gratitude, waking up every morning and being thankful for the breath that we are taking for at least five things to be grateful. Uh, that would also include thankful for our, our health, for the health of our family, for the health of our loved ones in general, our Cartwright family as well, and for um, our families, our our jobs, and of course, our faith. And I also uh, would like to share the about the positive leadership. So we were asked, we were asked what it is that we wanted to share that we were able or are able to make a difference on a daily basis. And so what I was able to share is that being in a leadership role we must lead by example. We cannot say, or we should never say, uh, do as I say, not as I do, but be able to walk the walk. And as long as we are able to lead by example, I believe that we will have a greater outcome. And our scholars will see, because they're watching everything we do and listening to everything we say. So that was one of the things I shared and I thought was a great takeaway to share here tonight. I also found in a leadership role, gossip is extremely painful, it's hurtful, and it's disappointing. And so how I internalize that is in a leadership role, for example, if I come across another board member, I'll use us as an example, and I see someone talking about someone else, and it may not be the nicest or kindest thing to say, we have an opportunity to either not be a part of it or to be a part of it, which will change the dynamics of our leadership role. So how do we expect or have expectations of you if you can't have them of us. So I would just say, lead by example. That's my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Ms. Abetia? Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, uh, executive team, and those in attendance. Um, I don't have much of a update. Um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Madrano for all of the COVID updates. I know that right now it's really scary in our district. Um, I also want to thank the district for allowing me to get COVID testing as much as I do, <laughs> because I, I seem to constantly be in contact with COVID and it's it's the district that we're, we're in right now and how high rates are. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to be negative. Um, although my household has not been testing negative lately. Um, so I just want to thank the district for being accessible to not only me, but to my family and to the community um, to get these testings done because it's have having have had me have having COVID. Oh my gosh, that's such a weird sentence. Uh, me having COVID in the past was like, it was extremely difficult on my personal mental health. Um, so 
I can only imagine those who have weaker immune systems and those who are younger who don't understand what's going on with their bodies, um, those who are older, that it, it's, it, it brings more fear to them. So I, I just want to send out my gratitude to the district for making these testings um, available to all of us. Um, and I, I highly recommend that if, you know, any of you need it, just please go get tested, get the booster, and get your shots because it's that's definitely something that has been keeping me negative is have had any shots um, compared to other people. Um, I don't think that's I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, that's the rest. Of, that's all in my update. Thank you, Ms. Abitia. Vice President Lopez. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, executive team, and those in the audience. Uh, thank you again for being here today at another board meeting. Um, hopefully, many more to come in person. Um, as we know, transition rates are getting higher and higher, so doing our part is, is crucial uh, to stay open. Um, I know the the idea to go back to vir virtual learning, it's it's scary, I would say. Um, I struggle a lot with one of my kids uh, to stay focused on a computer. So we we do everything we can at home. Uh, we do our part to stay healthy and um, limit our time outside of the house as much as possible. So hopefully uh, we know that our community continues to do the same. Well, we know that our parents continue to wear a mask. Um, and even in the mornings when they're dropping off, everybody's masked. So it's always a, a positive thing to see. That being said, I don't have much of another update. I was not able to attend the um, AC Alice conference this weekend, uh, but I am set to attend the uh, NSBA National Equity Symposium. So once we return from that, um, I'll be happy to bring in uh, materials and share my uh, learnings and best practices with the rest of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Hernandez. Thank you, Madam President, fellow board members, Dr. Lawler, executive team, and those uh, watching. Um, you know, and I was sharing here with um, my fellow board member, Mr. Lopez, when um, when Ms. Garcia began, because I had it written down. It was gratitude, grateful, grateful more than anything. I think I'm, I'm excited. I'm happy to be back. Um, Although, like Mr. Lopez, I wasn't, I was not able to be there Sunday. Um, I ended up working, but I continue to work uh, around with leadership around the nation. I won't be because I won't be able to attend the Washington uh, NSBA that I was so, you know, looking forward to. But uh, have touched base, has used that to prompt me to touch that base uh, with folks. Uh, in a while, and it's been very inspirational. So it's it's been a great feeling. I'm just grateful to be back, and I wish I could, you know, post up a picture, I, you know, with the love of my life here, <laughs> my my grandson. And so it's been great. I'm it's doing well. I'm glad and um, want to continue moving forward. And to your last point, Miss Mrs. Garcia, I remember just a very you know I've been around for for uh, a little while. <laughs> that, you know, I've been called, I've been done, I've been, you know, threatened, threatened, and physically threatened uh, and assaulted in the course of my duty of my work, um, the politics, you know. And I remember having a discussion of, you know, when we walk in, I think it was one of, it, our, our, one of our board trainings, that when we walk in here, you know, I cease to be Lydia, uh, my the grandma, right, but the professional that has to, uh, speak to the issues that impact our communities uh, and moving forward. So it's not personal, you know, and I just recommend that because otherwise, you know, it's gonna, it's, it's a challenge. So, but thank you, but I understand and I understand your point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you, Madam okay. President, uh, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, speaking to what you're saying, everyone in attendance, as I was uh, mentioning, you know, leading by example, what comes to mind is, and also what I mentioned, gossip. 
there is no room for gossip, none. And what I would suggest is loyalty. For example, if someone is saying something terrible, gossiping about me, I would hope that one of um, our leaders would respond, well, you know what, she's not that bad, <laughs> you know? So turning a negative into a positive. I mean, having the strength and the will not to minimize negativity, but to turn that negative into a positive. And, and that's it, just walk away. Thank you. Madam President, thank you. Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members and executive team. I did also forgot to mention uh, congratulations to board member Vice President Garcia on Sunday for your award at the AC Alas conference as well. Um, I believe you received an award for your um, community service, Dr. Lawler, or is that correct? Or what was the uh, award? The official word was the AC Alas Governing Board Member of the Year. <laughs> so congratulations. Um, I wanted to be there, but I, I had a family emergency, so I had to leave the country. But, you know, well-deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. <clears throat> So I just wanted to say congratulations to our young adult government at Glenelg Downs. Um, we're very proud of your leadership, an excellent job on the video. And thank you to uh, Mr. Alvarez as well for being an excellent leader mentor for our young adults in the, for our young adult government. It was a pleasure seeing them um, at the groundbreaking and to hear them speak uh, alongside our governing board as well um, at the groundbreaking for um, Glenel Downs Jim. <clears throat> also to Spitalny, congratulations on your PBIS award, major accomplishment. To our um, PR team, Ms. Veronica Sanchez, Alma Sotelo, and Brock Higley for your ASPRA award. Um, for the website, we definitely have an amazingly beautiful website. The content is easy to get through, and um, the accolades are definitely much appreciated. We're grateful for all of you. I also wanted to congratulate, I can't get, I'm sorry, I can't get my phone to work, and I was trying to get the actual name of the awards. Um, so I wasn't just playing with my phone. I wanted to congratulate Miss um, Garcia for her boardsmanship award. She tried to take the whole board with her, but I told her it is her award. Um, so she went up alone and very humbly and graciously accepted her award. So congratulations. Um, and then also to our um, teacher. Assistant principal. Sorry, assistant principal. Alice um, Alyssa Silva Gilbert for receiving the 2021-2022 AZLS Outstanding Aspiring Leader of Tomorrow Award. Um, so we had two professionals there, our educational professionals being um, honored that evening and uh, graciously accepting their awards. And it makes us very proud here at Cartwright um, to be the district that was awarded uh, such great honors. So thank you and congratulations to the two of you. Um, Thank you to everybody for continuing to stay positive. I know the last couple weeks, let's say years, but specifically the last couple of weeks have been challenging. Um, thank you for continuing to be resilient and for um, making sure that everything was covered, that our scholars were taken care of, and that you helped to take care of each other. So thank you. Um, your efforts don't go unnoticed. We definitely see what's happening out there and we appreciate all of you. Thank you for continuing to keep going through such challenging times. 
And then also, I just wanted to make a quick shout out to my little buddy, Jalen at Glenel Downs, and to let him know uh, to be his best. So be your best, Jalen, and make good decisions. Thank you. With that, I'll conclude my update. Madam President. Of course. Thank you, Madam President, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, our cabinet, all those who are in the audience and online. You know, I, I really did appreciate the, um, the award, the Boardsmanship Award. But one of the problems I had was the fact that I believed we all deserve it. Because without you, my voice is not heard. But we are one voice. And I feel that it is, I would be remiss if I did not include all of you. So thank you. Because I think we continue to hold this family together and our scholars a priority, which is how it should be. And whenever there is something that comes about that is necessary to preserve our scholars and our family, to keep them fed academically, emotionally, it is all of us that do it together. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. <clears throat> Before everyone in the room starts crying, we're going to move forward. <laughs> so number nine is our request for future agenda items as information and discussion at a future governing board meeting. Does anyone have a request? Oh, my God. Go ahead, Ms. Garcia. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, Dr. Aguilar Lawler, fellow board members, everyone in attendance. Uh, I would like to circle back to the immigrant families update and uh, just to find out what is uh, what those numbers look like, how many families are we really uh, able to serve, and is it does housing have to do with it? Does counseling have to do with it? Is it all academic? Uh, I'm excited to hear about that. And if it be the will of the board, that's what, what I would request. Mr. Fury? Yay. Thank you. Any other requests? Awesome. So we are going to move on to item I, which is our executive session. So I'd like to make a motion that pursuant to Arizona revised statute 39-431.03A5, the governing board may vote to convene into executive session, which will not be open to the public for discussions or consultations with designated representatives of the public body in order to consider its position and instruct its representatives on the salaries, salary schedules or compensation paid in the form of fringe benefits of employees of the public body regarding meet and confer. Do I have a second? Thank you. So we have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, and a second by Governing Board Member Garcia. Any discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Vice President Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Um, Ms. Abetia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. And Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? I vote aye. Thank you. I vote aye as well, and the motion carries. We will be exiting our regular session at 839 and going into executive session. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful evening. Drive safe. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you everyone.
All right, good evening and welcome back to our regular session. Let the record reflect it is 10.27 p.m. We're back in session. <clears throat> We're moving on to item K, which is the announcement of our future meeting date and other routine information concerning the governing board. The next public hearing regular governing board meeting will be held on Thursday, January 27th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Does it start at 5? Yes. yes. Instead of 4? Okay. Because of the public hearing. Okay. All right. So January 27th at 5 p.m. we have our next public hearing regular governing board meeting. Moving on to item L, which is adjournment. I'd like to make a motion for adjournment of the Cartwright Elementary School District Governing Board meeting, regular meeting for January 13th, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. So we have a motion made by myself, Marissa Hernandez, a second by Ms. Garcia. Um, we'll do no discussion and we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Hernandez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Vice President Lopez, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Ms. Abathia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. And Ms. Garcia, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. I vote aye as well. And the motion carries unanimously. Let the record reflect it as 10.28 p.m. Meeting is adjourned. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you on the